Senhoras e senhores, a Fundação Getúlio Vargas tem a satisfação de recebê-los para mais um evento. Sejam bem-vindos ao auditório do Centro Cultural FGV. Nosso auditório possui rede Wi-Fi, nome e senha da rede, exibidos nos prismas localizados na recepção ou nos telões após este vídeo. Solicitamos que não sejam consumidos alimentos e bebidas no interior do auditório. Solicitamos ainda que os telefones celulares sejam mantidos no modo silencioso e com flashes desativados. Para maior conforto e segurança, fiquem atentos aos procedimentos a serem seguidos em caso de emergência. Nosso auditório está estruturado com três saídas de emergência, todas identificadas com placas de orientação e equipadas com barras antipânico. De frente para o palco, temos duas saídas, uma no lado esquerdo e outra no lado direito. Uma terceira saída de emergência está localizada na parte superior ao fundo do auditório. Os extintores de incêndio estão localizados nas laterais do palco e ao fundo do auditório, um em cada lado, e estão sinalizados conforme as normas internacionais de segurança. Em caso de incêndio, os detectores de fumaça localizados no teto acionam o um sistema de alarme e nossa brigada de incêndio, devidamente treinada, entra em ação. Em caso de queda de energia, o grupo gerador será acionado. Vale lembrar que em caso de emergência, os elevadores não devem ser utilizados. E para maior segurança, nosso auditório é monitorado com câmeras de segurança 24 horas. A Fundação Getúlio Vargas, desde já, agradece a presença de todos em nosso Centro Cultural e deseja a todos os presentes um ótimo evento. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here, and we are sorry for this delay. Um, so it's my pleasure to open this first round table of the Sun Annual Conference, and the aim is to continue the thought-provoking conversation that our keynote address uh, started yesterday, but now focusing in the theme, Rights and Ethics in the Digital Age. Uh, and now I'll let me introduce you to our esteemed chair panel, uh, session chair, Professor Luca Belli uh, is a professor of digital governance and regulation at Fundação Getúlio Vargas Law School here in Rio de Janeiro, where he directs the Center for Technology and Society. So welcome, Luca. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And um, I'll let you present the panelists. Uh, one of them, Dennis Kicker, is, uh, was not able to come to Rio, so we now have three panelists. Uh, Professor Erden Urich, who was sitting around here, just realized he's not. <laughs> well, I'll, but I'll let you begin, Luca. Thank you. And this is for one of sorry. them was not able to be here, and one is currently missing, but he will be here <laughs> in a couple of minutes. So I will start with the other two. Uh, so first of all, welcome to everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here at the Sun conference and it's great to be also in this session on rights and ethics in digital age uh, as was mentioned we have this center for technology and society here at, at the law school that deals with the intersection between law and uh, technology so our society is impacted uh, with regard to the evolution of technology and how law can catch up with the evolution of technology and how also technology regulates somehow society. So on, the, on our perspective from lawyers, uh, although we have a very interdisciplinary center, from our perspective we really deal with regulation, but we cannot understand how regulation works or fails without having these very smart people here telling us uh, concrete evidence uh, using data about how technology is evolving and what is the impact of technology on society, right? So it's a great pleasure to be here today introducing this very interesting uh, set of uh, panelists with very interesting 
pragmatic approaches to how technology is shaping society. Uh, I will start, uh, well, in, in order we have uh, Erdem Joruk that is currently missing, but <laughs> I hope will be here. <laughs> But he will be here, don't worry. <laughs> then uh, uh, following with Richard Weixing Hu from University of Macau uh, that will discuss on network discourse power in the digital age. And then we have Camilla Scarpellino from Lewis that will discuss uh, the AI liability gap in the European solution, which is a highly, also highly interesting topic we have seen also in Brazil over the past uh, months that have been uh, proposals to regulate AI and there is a lot of debate between how uh, AI can be framed from uh, both perspective, both sides of the Atlantic. We just had a couple of weeks ago a conference with the European Union on this. We have here now with us uh, Professor Erdem Jörg from uh, uh, Koch University that will discuss the Politus project uh, ethical public opinion research with social media data. Thank you very much for being with us. So as we have started with a little bit of delay, I propose we directly enter into the debate. We ha you have more or less 15 to 20 minutes each to present the finding of your, of your uh, project and initiative, and then we will open the floor for discussions with the audience. So I suggest we start directly with uh, Erdem Jörg, if you are already uh, fine with the presentation. There is a, uh, a control here, a remote control, if you need any PowerPoint presentation. If not, uh, we can start. And then also let me also remind that the presentations uh, and the conference will be recorded. And I hope everyone here agrees. Uh, and also I just wanted to highlight that everyone here is expressing only personal opinion and no official position of FGV. So please, after you, uh, Professor uh, Jörg. Hello. Ah. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Erdem Jörg. I'm, I'm from Turkey, from Koch University. I'm a sociologist uh, and I'm, I serve as the director of the Center for Computational Social Sciences at Koch University. And for the last, uh, I would say, uh, 12 years, I've been working on computational social science through different uh, projects, mostly uh, be funded by uh, the European Commission. Uh, I started my journey in 2010-13 uh, with a Marie Curie grant. Uh, those of you from Europe uh, may be familiar with that. And I expanded my research into a comparison between Turkey and Brazil, and then I got an ERC grant. With this, I started to understand the uh, <coughs> dynamics of welfare state development around the world, and I, I was looking at uh, political factors, and for this, I, uh, I, I, I took on this task of creating a protest events data set using online news sources. And I will uh, uh, present the results of this first project uh, tomorrow, hopefully. And then uh, this Politus project was born out of this previous uh, ERC project. This is another ERC project. Uh, it's an ERC proof of concept project. It, is, uh, it means that you, uh, you are given the chance to uh, create a social or economic impact out of an existing ERC uh, project. And uh, we use NLP and uh, machine learning and different computational social science methods to create uh, protests or in uh, broadly defined contentious political information from online news sources. But in this Politus project, we are changing our focus and this time we are looking at online uh, social platforms and we are trying to understand public opinion in general. And in an effort to complement, scale up, or even maybe replace traditional survey polls in a privacy preserving and GDPR compliant uh, manner. 
so the, the basic question that I'm asking here is how can we imagine the future of public opinion research in the age of AI, big data, and uh, online social platforms, and especially in the era of the Cambridge Analytica scandal, how can we collect, store, and process special categories of personal data, which means like uh, political opinions, religiosity, ethnicity, etc., etc., which are pars uh, part and parcel of what we call public opinion. Uh, and how can we extract such information, process such information from online social platforms in a GDPR compliant and privacy preserving manner? And this is important because uh, this new research was born out of a necessity. I got this new ERC grant and I had to go through an ethics review process and it took us more than six months. It was so difficult, it was so challenging because the ERC ethics committee questioned whether we are going to be a next, next Cambridge Analytica, are we going to misuse the data, are we going to violate GDPR, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously we are far away from such an intention, but uh, in any case we have to confirm, we have to show them that this was not the case. And uh, the entire process was so challenging, and this challenge has taught us that uh, this new question, uh, this uh, very question of uh, complying with ethical standards and GDPR standards could be another new research project. And now we check on this new project, and uh, this is actually uh, half a project and half a proposal, uh, because we are applying to a new European Commission uh, consortium right next week on the 7th uh, we, as a consortium of uh, Koch University, Utrecht University and Gessis in, in Germany. Uh, and so, uh, so the Politis project, so it's an, it's, it tries to develop an innovative methodology to deliver representative, high frequency, multilingual, multi-country, longitudinal panel data on public opinion trends in a privacy preserving and GDPR compliant uh, manner. Um, so the, the original question was how can we scale up uh, or transcend a classical surveys and social media monitoring. Classical surveys has a uh, have number of limitations like in terms of geographical limitations, sample size, cost, low response rates, uh, uh, social desirability bias, etc. And social media monitoring uh, as this biggest problem of representation. Uh, and how can we co develop a new technology to uh, understand public opinion from online uh, platforms in a representative way? Uh, so uh, this, this brings together a lot of components uh, like data cleaning, elimination of vocal uh, users, uh, representativeness, validation, and human in the loop approach. But uh, let me talk about our methodology to extract public opinion in general. First of all, we started with Turkey. We collected a Twitter user data set of 20, uh, 53 million users. These are the entire set of people who have, or users who have ever showed up on Twitter, including bots and like institutional accounts, uh, everything. And out of this 53 million, we identified one and a half million users uh, whose gender, location, and uh, age we could identify. And then we collected their Twitter data uh, and so everything is based on uh, deep learning models and we need to develop, a, we, we choose two different methods to build our machine learning models. On the one hand, we took on an entire uh, long process of data labeling. Uh, we randomly choose uh, over 50,000 tweets uh, out of this pool and then uh, we, we graduate students at Koch University annotated uh, these tweets according to the indicators that we are interested in. For example, if any tweet is left-wing, right-wing, religious, happy, 
supporting the uh, president or su supporting the opposition, uh, the, 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 the topic of conversation, if it is about economy uh, or the earthquake, uh, anything. So uh, over 30 indicators uh, we had, and we, we had uh, the, the huge gold standard corpus for this annotated uh, twist, double annotation and adjudicated uh, twist. Uh, and then we built models to predict uh, such characteristics of every single tweet in our data set. And then we, we translate these predictions on based on tweets into predictions based on users. And then from users, then we aggregate everything uh, at the province level. So this is the one, uh, this is one path. And the other path is, uh, this is what we are currently doing, uh, is uh, what we call the amplified, amplified learning. Um, maybe you are familiar with the work of uh, Bloom and Stock who uh, used, uh, who combined uh, a phone survey and a telecom signals uh, to create a poverty map uh, of Rwanda. And uh, so we are uh, following that approach and we are organizing a, a, an online survey uh, and we, 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 we find the respondents from uh, Twitter and then we ask such questions like who are you going to vote for or are you happy or are you religious? And then we collect and we take a Twitter handles, Twitter accounts of these respondents, and we collect their tweets uh, for a certain time period. And then we build models that would predict the survey questionnaire responses with the tweets that these respondents have uh, posted for the last three months, for example. And so this is the second approach to build machine learning uh, models. Then we predict the results, as I said, and then representativeness issue, uh, Twitter data, uh, like all social uh, online platforms, is very biased in terms of demography and all other things. And we are using the uh, multi method of multi-level regression with post-stratification uh, to weight and to correct this bias and to attain a uh, uh, representative uh, result. And we have validated our result with uh, existing surveys. We compared our results on religiosity, for example, with an existing uh, survey uh, with, uh, by an, uh, an external outsider researcher uh, who conducts the survey on religiosity and uh, the, the results are quite uh, promising. Then we create a data platform and we share this data with those who are interested. So let me, uh, so I was planning to play with this uh, website, but uh, so I can do it later on. So, uh, so in this uh, web platform, you can choose an output, for example, sorry, this is in very much in Turkish, but an emotion, uh, emotion like hatred, and then on the right hand side, you choose some filters. Uh, for example, you choose young males, and as the topic, you choose uh, like refugees, and then that will show you the uh, distribution, geographical distribution of uh, the hatred among young males in Turkey against refugees in terms of, uh, in the context of refugees. Uh, so we can zoom in and out, uh, or we can just say, just approval rates of political leaders among, uh, a political leader among conservative law income women, etc. So these are actually what, uh, as sociologists, what we are interested in uh, public opinion research. And it is possible to extract such a, 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 a data uh, from online platforms in a representative uh, way. However, so let me see if I'm missing, uh, I was quick in anything else, no. 
Uh, and uh, so, uh, so we, we, we have been working on this for uh, more than a year, and we are a large team of uh, compute computational linguists, computer scientists, mathematicians, economists, sociologists, political scientists. It's a pretty and much an interdisciplinary large team uh, of scholars. So uh, we are confident that we are able to extract this data. Uh, but the problem is that if this is ethical, if this is legal, uh, because uh, 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 GDPR, uh, tells you that it is forbidden, it is not allowed to process special categories of data of users in general, except for a number of uh, cases. For example, doing a research, scientific research, is one of the legal basis of uh, processing such a data. So. And we are allowed by the ERC Ethics Committee to continue with this research because we relied on uh, Article uh, Article 9, but uh, like, uh, points, I forgot it. Uh, but at some uh, point in GDPR, which shows that if you are doing scientific research, this will be a legal basis. But if you uh, broaden your question, if, for example, think that you are a research, private research company interested in understanding public opinion, or cons if you are doing consumer research, if you are trying to understand uh, like uh, electoral results, uh, predict electoral results, is it possible for you to do that? No, under current uh, circumstances, no. Uh, because either you have to get an informed consent from every single user, which is an impossible thing in social media because we are talking about millions of users, uh, or you have to do a scientific research, or, I mean, that should be a catastrophe, for example, under COVID uh, pandemic, so uh, some, some things are uh, much more flexible. But under normal uh, conditions, uh, you are not allowed to do this. How can you do this uh, if your data is fully Anonymize, then you are outside of the scope of GDPR. Then anonymization is the only safe route to uh, GDPR compliance. But uh, if it's, uh, it is difficult because uh, we are aggregating everything at the uh, province level here. Uh, I mean, this this shows, for example. Level of uh, anxiety in Istanbul. So everything is anonymous here in the uh, as the outcome. But en route uh, in in your pipeline, at some point you collect data on specific individual Twitter users, and these people uh, they post something on Twitter. But this does not mean that they allow you to process their own data, their own posts with advanced AI methods to extract something about these people, even uh, that is not uh, even these people not aware of, uh, for example. Uh, therefore, uh, so they are not posted for third parties to conduct systematic analysis to extract special categories of uh, data. Explicit consent cannot also be a lawful basis. So the question is, how does, for example, a research on organization, private or public, generate sensitive public opinion data from online social platforms? And how do we reconcile our concerns to protect data rights and privacy of citizens and, how, and our needs to understand public opinion? Because in the future, most probably, we will be understanding our society from these online platforms. But we have to uh, find a solution for this. And uh, so in this new proposal, we are trying to develop, uh, it's, uh, the test, develop or try, so the, a new methodology uh, to, to do this, to, to, to manage this. And this will be based on a, uh, a much more interdisciplinary collaboration between computer scientists, 
legal and GDPR experts and uh, social scientists. And we will be using uh, local differential privacy, the state of the art uh, privacy preserving methods, uh, privacy preserving network analysis, generative AI models like uh, the uh, very popular GPT, uh, and uh, that will give language based simulations of uh, human uh, samples. How much time do I have? Finished. Okay. So, uh, ethics, um, so uh, in this new consortium, uh, guesses, for example, will be responsible uh, if we are funded, uh, hopefully, which is very unlikely because this is extremely uh, competitive. Uh, so, guesses uh, will be trying uh, the use of large language models uh, like BERT3 uh, or but uh, the most recently uh, GPT3 to simulate, to create synthetic data uh, that would represent public opinion. You can ask GPT, uh, what it would be, uh, what would you uh, vote for in the coming elections if you are a 50 year old conservative man living in Turkey. And so there are really interesting studies that shows that uh, this has validity. I mean, uh, and so the, the, the simulated data is very, uh, I mean, in reasonable uh, margins, uh, close to uh, real data, and there is really room for development here, and we will try to explore and experiment this uh, in the next three years. And uh, so we will, we will compare uh, different uh, large language models uh, in different languages, and we will try open source and commercial uh, language models. And on the other hand, uh, there will be a competing size, uh, site. How do we anonymize uh, such data uh, when we are downloading uh, this data at the first moment? Uh, because uh, if you uh, uh, if you download, if you collect a, a Twitter user ID and some tweets from this person. Uh, for a second and then remove everything, this is already gone. So, I mean, you are not uh, allowed to uh, collect or process any non-anonymized data in your uh, service. This is challenging. Uh, anonymization is challenging because we are trying to, uh, for two reasons, because uh, we are trying to have a panel data, a continuous panel data. So if we keep, uh, if you lose uh, track of individual users, then we will, it will be uh, much harder to update our new data when new uh, social media posts uh, come in next week. And the second thing is that uh, there is this uh, vocal user problem. Uh, there are vocal users that send tweets, like a uh, hundred tweets uh, every day and they are actually pushing or pulling the public opinion into certain directions if you just take the uh, like arithmetic mean of the results. Therefore, uh, our analysis should be based on users, not based on tweets. Uh, and yeah, therefore, uh, this focus on users necessitates some engagement with these privacy issues and therefore, there should be a new technology to deal with this. And uh, local differential privacy uh, and tax sanitization uh, and differentially private uh, language models, machine learning models uh, are uh, expected to solve this uh, question. Uh, yeah, I think my time is over. Uh, I feel like uh, Fidel Castro in United Nations who talked exactly 10 minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really a fascinating uh, presentation and actually raises a lot of issues that we are facing globally uh, with regard to research, the fact of for instance, you were mentioning 
large language models like GPT-3 or the other ones that you are uh, adopting the fact that to make them compatible with data protection regulation, which is not only some a GDPR, we always speak about GDPR, but there are 162 countries in the world with data protection laws, including China, all Europe, many Latin American countries. We have LGPD, which is our GDPR uh, in Brazil, and all that, uh, that regulations mandate uh, legality, fairness, and transparency in the processing of data. But it's very challenging to uh, first having a legal base because he, when you tweet, you do not agree to have your data used for whatever research. And transparency, also because if with the kind of research you do or uh, any kind of uh, language, uh, large language model is extremely complicated to explain. So being transparent in how the processing works is extraordinarily challenging. And uh, last but not least, of course, if you have to, to uh, fairly treat the, the, uh, the process of data, me that means being able to communicate how the data will be, the, f the, the purpose of the uh, data processing, it's really challenging when the, the, the model is so complex that you may not know at the very beginning how the model wi will perform. So it's extraordinarily challenging. You were point pointing to a very good uh, uh, direction, which is anonymization, but there, there is another challenge. That the, most, the more you anonymize, the less useful <laughs> are the de become the data. So it's really uh, very interesting, the project you are developing. I really look forward to reading more about this and also how do you uh, manage to reconcil reconcile the processing with legislation. And now, to, without further ado, I would like to ask Professor uh, Richard Weixing Hu to uh, please take the floor and uh, present on his uh, network discourse power in the digital age. So please, Professor Hu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> now, before I start, uh, first uh, let me uh, f thank uh, uh, <coughs> uh, FBC, uh, FGC, well, sorry, FGC for hosting this uh, conference. And uh, I'm from Macau, China, and uh, University of Macau is glad to be a new member of this uh <coughs> Uh, university uh, network, uh, uh, you know, we, we call SUN, uh, uh, Social Science University Network. And uh, this is really fantastic forum uh, to exchange views with colleagues from all over the world. I hope in the future, University of Macau will have the, have the opportunity to host you we can continue this dialogue. Now, uh, my presentation, the topic will be on uh, network discourse power in digital age. Uh, we just heard an excellent presentation from uh, Professor Eldon uh, talking about uh, uh, his research, uh, the Politics Project and Ethic public opinion research uh, with social media and data. And uh, his presentation is more about how we can use the uh, data uh, we collect, the data privacy, the legality, and the uh, ethics problems using these data. I think that's fantastic. Now, my presentation will be uh, approach the issues from different angle. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about how data can be a power because uh, I'm a political scientist by training. I also do a lot of research uh, in international relations. And uh, Professor Eldon is a psychologist, right? Yeah, a sociologist, I'm sorry, a sociologist. Uh, so we're from different uh, profession, different uh, a discipline approach to look at these issues. Now, in my disciplines, uh, the key concept is power. <laughs> you know, when I was undergraduate, we studied power, 
what is power in international relations? And uh, people talk about hard power. Hard power is how much GDP you have, how much weaponry, how much uh, trading power, and how much material power you can produce. Now, uh, since 21st century, another term becoming more and more popular, which is we call soft power. Soft power is how your system, your ideology, your image could be a power, could be an international influence over others. So uh, as we enter into a digital age, I think data is a power, is a soft power. It has implicit influence over people. And uh, here comes the key questions, the who controls the data and how the data is presented to people. Uh, so this is how, where I approach these issues. So I'm going to talk about data as a discourse power from two angles. The first perspective is to look at data as discourse power and how this discourse power is related to our human network. So how the human network influence the discourse power. This is the first angle. The second angle I'm going to talk about follow yesterday's, uh, I think um, uh, from, uh, from uh, F FGC, uh, Professor uh, uh, Vlavio talking about uh, machine, AI, and discourse power, and the data. So that's my second angle. So for the sake of time, I'm going to just focus two points. First, to look at discourse power and human uh, networks. Now, as we distinguished what is hard power, what is soft power, soft power is, to an IR scholar, is in international society, whose story you believe, or whose story is more convincing than others. And, uh, or you can say, according, according to Joseph Nye, uh, Joseph Nye uh, is a professor from Harvard University who created these terms. He argued that in international relations, you know, people are telling stories whose story you believe, right? If country A's story is more powerful, more convincing, in the end, it will prevail that country A have more power, soft power than others, than country B or C. Um, so give, me, give you an example. Recently, between United States and China, there's a problem called balloon problem. There's a Chinese uh, civilian balloon overflow U.S. territory, and the U.S. media have played that as a big issues and to the world, to the citizen. And then it is portrayed as China has violated U.S. territorial airspace, have portrayed as China use some strange weapons to violate U.S. sovereignty. So, so China is the villain. So the here it shows the soft power, how you portray a story to make uh, the other country's image is bad and uh, you are victim of the other country's um, uh, behavior. So uh, here, this uh, storytelling power the, the discourse power, of course, is shaped, is controlled by media. Now we can see in today's world, the Western media have much powerful influence and their story is probably more influence, more convincing than others. This is truth, this is truth. 
So the actual fact is there's every day or every, um, every year, according to uh, International Civilian Aviation Organization, there's thousands of these kind of balloons or artificial object overflying in the airspace or in the between the airspace and the outer space. There's many of these. And uh, according to Chinese information, US uh, balloons uh, overfly China uh, by dozen, over a dozen US uh, balloons fly, overfly China each year. But, but Chinese did not get this story reported. So, but US can exaggerate one Chinese balloons overfly US territories. So this is uh, make US have more discourse power on that issues and China is portrayed as violation of US territories. Uh, so you can see um, the information released and information manipulated and then becoming the discourse power United States have. So now why US have such a, a discourse power? Because uh, the traditional media, the network, even the social media platform controlled by US and uh, or invented by the Western countries. So US is able to use its, so its media, its social media as well, to, uh, to create a framing effect on things happened internationally. So this is what we call discourse power in international relations. Now, <coughs> today's world is well connected. You know, people are connected, people get news instantly from their social media tools, from the news agencies, from in the internet. Now who have the more power in shaping the information given and what you received is probably, you can see those big media powers. So social, so human network in is, is penetrated by the information or feed the information by uh, by these uh, uh, media uh, platforms. So data and information penetrate to human network and uh, we, uh, through certain language, which language is more powerful, which language is more used in the world? Obviously, everybody knows. Even we standing here, we coming from different country, we speak English. So language is another uh, indication uh, which country have more, uh, which, which, which country or countries have more uh, uh, discourse power. Discourse power, uh, you know, in Chinese means hua yu quan, and uh, I have to distinguish discourse power and a discourse right. Now, discourse right, uh, according to Chinese, Chinese did not distinguish the right and the discourse power because the right is whether you can speak out. Everybody can speak out. But whether you speak out, have the similar influence over others, that's a different story. So the right and the discourse power is a, dif is a different thing. So um, now you're clear about uh, in the current social media, in the current media environment, who has more discourse power. Now let me turn quickly for the sake of time let me quickly turn to the second perspective I want to uh, share with you in this platform, which is the machine and the discourse power, how we view the technology advancement and how that will shape the uh, discourse power in today's digital age. Um, now, machine, um, yesterday we have an excellent keynote speech um, uh, Professor Vlavio uh, shared with us his thought about uh, uh, the uh, big data, AI, how we get information. Now, uh, my uh, view is, uh, I think in a similar line along his uh, speech, 
I think there are four things very important in the, in the, in the digital age, in the age of AI and the big data. Now, we have to ask these key questions. First, um, the, uh, what language uh, we use in the in the future, um, uh, in the future, uh, AI and the big data uh, period. Now, obviously, English is still important, but I would say it's less becoming less and less important because AI uh, and uh, Chat uh, GPT could be different versions. You know, all other countries uh, follow the suit. Uh, they they also develop their own version of Chat GP, GTP. Now, uh, but still, English is uh, more important because uh, uh, ch currently the ch Chat GPT becoming very popular. It is the English version. It developed by the Open AI, and uh, as American company. Now, second questions uh, we have to ask ourselves: these big data. Uh, who control these data? Uh, data is power. And um, uh, we are all social scientists. We do research about data. You know, we just heard um, um, uh, Professor Eldon uh, talking about his uh, project, collecting data. But data is something infinite. You cannot collect everything. You know, it's to some degrees. Now we do the social science research, we use quantitative method, we use samples to, to, uh, um, uh, to derive our conclusion on certain social phenomena. But in the future, we have the capability to collect as much as possible data. But uh, still, in, it is something infinite. And uh, the other thing is who have the ability to control this data. In a, uh, I think the big companies, you know, uh, Microsoft, uh, Google, uh, these obviously they have the power to collect more data than, than many countries putting together. Uh, so they, they control the data. So data is something every country, everyone want to have a hand on, but uh, who eventually control more data, who will be more powerful, more that can be translated into discourse power. This is my first argument. The second one, if you have the data, does that mean you, you have more discourse power? Not necessary. Computational power is also very important. W can you processing handle this data you know, computational power is very important. Yesterday we heard the number, you know, um, how OpenAI and uh, use uh, their huge data to develop uh, chat GPT. And uh, computational power is, requires a lot of resources, lot of requires a lot of uh, computational, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, big server to calculate and also a lot of electricity. There's a lot of uh, technical requirement as well. So this is the second thing. Now, third thing is how we use data, how we put, uh, develop some program processing this data and then translate these data to useful apps. And uh, applications is very important, uh, whether we misuse the data or use the data correctly. You know, chat GPT is a good example. We are now uh, moving toward the directions to use this data, to use this data in an intelligent way. Uh, we use AI, human intelligence, to help us to, uh, to use, apply this data for us. Uh, chat GPT is basically um, stand for pre-trained, uh, generated, pre-trained um, language transformer, which is a uh, chat programs, you know, uh, it's getting smarter, not just uh, uh, serve you, provide you, present you the data you wanted, like Google. We type in the word, Google give, give us a set of information. 
ChatGTP even gets smarter, can talk back to us, can tell us, can dictate the answer to us. You know, how they can do that? It has, has to follow certain logic, right? The, cert the logic is Athermether, we, we used how we calculate them. And then um, we, uh, we heard that um, uh, the uh, engineerings in open AI, there are 400 of these very smart engineerings, they use 170 billion parameters to create this powerful chat GPT. In the future, probably this program becoming more and more powerful more, more and more parameters were put in. But these parameters, these are the human uh, wisdom to, to dictate uh, the data, to use the database or to program processing the data. They are human wisdoms. But in the future, if the machine becoming smarter as human being, what do we do? Now, most important thing is the chat GPTs they follow a different logic than human logic. In human um, thinking, we have our own reasoning. We call it rationality. Our reasoning is no matter uh, where you're from, you're Chinese, you're Turkish, you're Americans, you're Brazilians, our human logic is based on certain uh, basic assumptions. We have our own human values, some are universal, and uh, we have that dictate our rationalities. But in the future, the chat GPT, the AIs, what kind of uh, um, rationality they have, and what is the basic logic, the bottom line logic, um, uh, AI and chat GPT type of AI machines will operate, this is unknown. If I'm, I'm pretty sure they will be operate on the, a little bit different logic uh, from human beings, because uh, you can see, you can you can tell ChatGPT uh, ask a question, they give you a different answer each time. They even you ask the same question, they give you a different answer. Why? Because they are pre-trained, you know, using huge language database, and uh, it which is means. Our answer trained the machine to follow certain logic and then give us answers. Now, this logic rationale is different from human, uh, eventually will be different from human beings thinking. So this is dangerous. Uh, people are concerned whether we will be controlled by machines. And uh, so, uh, so here, uh, our a lot of our uh, information, uh, the information we received, a lot of discourse will be dictated by this chat GPT type of rationality, the logic. So our discourse power will be reshaped. And then this is something we really have to think hard about this. So I do not have the answer to them. I just raised the question and thank you for for lessening my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hu. Uh, you really raised some very interesting questions that I think we can even explore further in the Q&A. Uh, two things that I really enjoyed. Uh, the fir first, your, your distinctions among, among different types of power, uh, classic command and control power, but also soft power. I also, uh, when you were speaking, I thought a lot of something that I really teach uh, a lot to my students, which is also about structural power, which is what Sudan Strange in the late 80s elaborated with states and market, and which is, I think, uh, I, I, I will share with you some, uh, a couple of papers that I have on this, on how structural power actually creates a sort of new type of private sovereignty, where there is the, the, those, the, the enterprises, usually large tech corporations that define the algorithms, the architecture, the technical architecture of the, the various. So, so, so power. Exactly, it's, it's not, it, power is not only about commanding or influencing, but it's also shaping the structure 
according to which society evolves. And this is the, the kind of technology that we are using today. It's really a very good example of this. And also, we something that you were mentioning, that we may end up having technology that is smarter than humans and influences. I think we also have to really always keep in mind that uh, we, there are always humans behind the development of technology. And so we, sti so far at least, we still have always not only the uh, power, but also the responsibility to have humans behave according, creating the technology. So we, uh, we, we, read, we, we hear a lot about AI is going to steal our jobs and this kind of uh, uh, things, but actually, a a so far, at least, AI is not self-conscious, willing to steal our jobs, but is programmed to maybe uh, automatize a lot of tasks so that people that program it can uh, increase their profits <laughs> because they fire people <laughs> and, and, uh, and automatize tasks. But so far, there is always humans behind technology. But that is a very important point that I think really needs a lot more discussion. Uh, and I honestly, uh, I think that as uh, in, in, the, in the Western world, people should be a lot more uh, self-conscious of this and a lot less hubristic in criticizing how other cultures are approaching technology because there is really a, a huge lack of understanding of these key points that you were mentioning. And I really, we will have, I think we will have a very good debate in the uh, Q&A about this, not before having heard the last, but of course not least presentation on AI and uh, liability gap in the European Solution by Camilla Scarpellino from Lewis. Please, Camilla, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I want, first of all, I want to thank my university and uh, the Foundation uh, of Getulio Vargas for this opportunity to share with you my, a part of my research progr program for PhD. And uh, my presentation uh, um, uh, talks about uh, the regulation of uh, artificial intelligence in Europe. And uh, currently there is uh, no regulation, but uh, uh, EU Commission suggests, uh, proposed uh, two different uh, regulations, the AI Act and uh, the AI Liability Directive. Um, uh, as you can see in my, in my first slide, uh, the Commission definition of AI is, uh, um, is uh, about uh, software, is uh, described that, uh, like software that uh, exhibit intelligent behavior by analyzing their environment and performing actions with a certain degree of autonomy to achieve specific uh, uh, goals. Um, this definition describes artificial intelligence systems uh, as software capable of correctly understanding the reality and uh, self-determinating based on the data that they collected uh, with, uh, uh, during their operation. So uh, artificial intelligence can uh, learn uh, from uh, uh, its experience. Uh, how? Uh, thanks to machine learning or uh, deep learning. Uh, today we uh, already talk about that, uh, so I can uh, um, uh, I can describe I can describe a very um, very fast uh, like uh, a system that uh, can uh, or supervising or, or with uh, um, a supervisor that guide the uh, software to learn the correct results or the correct finding from the data that you put in or without uh, uh, supervision by its human. This uh, last artificial kind of artificial intelligence uh, uh, is not uh, already uh, used. The most uh, used is the first one with machine learning. Uh, the, uh, um, so artificial intelligence goes beyond uh, uh, the uh, correlation uh, that uh, a programmer uh, gives to the software uh, and uh, is capable to uh, outperform humans also because not uh, also because he uh, ha it had more speed than uh, the human to process and collect data uh, so outperforming humans uh, not in cognitive potential but in the speed uh, then, the machine can uh, then the machine can solve a problem uh, more quickly and efficiently. 
because computers uh, don't, uh, does not follow the uh, traditional scientific uh, follow the traditional scientific method with the difference that uh, they it, they have a huge volume uh, of uh, data but this is uh, um, uh, but there are the facts of they ca we can uh, see a defects of artificial intelligence uh, because in some cases uh, there is a divergence between uh, the algorithmic uh, uh, prediction, so the answer that uh, artificial intelligence gives to us uh, uh, after we put uh, some data in it, uh, and the practical result. The practical results are the, um, the research and uh, investigation of the human about uh, uh, on the same data and we, uh, what we can uh, um, uh, understand about the same data, but uh, it's different from the uh, algorithmic uh, um, answer. If a data set is, uh, why we have this divergence? Because if a data set is incomplete, the algorithm, uh, algorithmic conclusion will also be incomplete and misleading. This flow is uh, further aggravated by the, uh, by the uh, AI system, a lack of communication. Uh, because uh, which uh, the uh, computer don't compares, don't, doesn't compares, doesn't discuss, uh, or clarifies, uh, clarifies the reason uh, supporting uh, its uh, findings. Then, uh, recognizing, recognizing an erroneous prediction uh, because it's based on discriminatory assumption uh, and uh, also understanding the malfunction is very difficult. Uh, because or also because the current regulation don't, al uh, don't allow to, um, the disclosure of uh, the source code of the algorithm. Of the algorithmic. Then um, uh, I can. Then um, AI. I have. Then uh, in Europe, uh, the current regulation now about the defect of the product. Uh, so also the software, uh, is the European Product Liability Directive. It is inadequate uh, uh, for the uh, mentioned needs and for the mentioned defects uh, because it requires uh, that the injured party, to requires the injured party to prove the product defect, the, dam the damage and the causal link between the, these two. Proof of the product defect uh, is uh, an obstacle uh, due to uh, inaccessibility um, due to the inaccessibility of the al uh, the, al the software because uh, uh, for the uh, things that I said before that uh, there is no uh, mandatory regulation that uh, can uh, um, the, that can. Uh, um, give to us uh, the right uh, to have uh, the source of the, the source code of the uh, algorithmic. Uh, the opaqueness and the uh, unpredictability of AI make the current uh, European uh, um, regulation uh, so not do not respond to our needs and to the new characteristics uh, of the uh, artifi artificial intelligence. Proof of the product defect uh, is uh, very difficult and uh, is impossible for the plaintiff to prove that the machine uh, has a malfunction. Uh, furthermore, even the manufacturer may not be aware of the cause of the damage. In fact, um, in machine learning based systems are co very complex organisms, so several factors uh, could have affected uh, their operation, uh, like incorrect data, incorrect uh, data interference, uh, or also poor maintenance. From this, uh, we deduce uh, that the fault uh, might not lie with uh, uh, the manufacturer or the hardware component, uh, but with the software programmers uh, or also the trainer of the, uh, or the algorithm. Or uh, also uh, the fault, uh, it uh, may be lay with uh, the database uh, that they use to train the artificial intelligence. The difficulty to prove the defect uh, and identify the liable person, the responsible, show a liability gap. Then uh, it is necessary to clarify what uh, are the legal solutions envisaged by the legislature uh, and the doctrine for damages uh, caused by instruments with decision-making uh, making capacity. 
I have to uh, come back to the slide, to this slide. I know that we uh, already talked about GDPR, but uh, uh, I want to talk ab uh, about another article, that is the Article 22. Uh, the Article 22 laid down uh, a greater protection for data processing that is fully automated uh, and significantly affects the individual. Uh, the protection provides that the data subject may opt out of the decision uh, that significantly affects the individual. The protection provided the data um, uh, can uh, alternatively or objecting to the processing uh, or may express his uh, or her opinion by contesting the conclusion of the data processing that is uh, only uh, uh, automating with also with computers and uh, with no human intervention. Both solutions, however, presuppose that the data subject has been informed or informed of the processing, but also uh, it's necessary uh, a, um, a specific information to the person. Uh, the, um, that is uh, not uh, the information that AI uses, because uh, AI uses uh, anonymized data and uh, would not give grounds for action because it is not uh, referable to the individual. So it's uh, not uh, data, uh, personal data, uh, that is uh, one of the uh, conditions to, uh, to, to have a right uh, for action against, uh, for example, uh, the manufacturer, also the programmers of the artificial intelligence. Uh, so we can go again to the normative proposals of the European Commission. Uh, the European Commission uh, in the 2021 and then uh, last year uh, laid down two different proposed uh, and the Artificial Intelligence Act, uh, and uh, then uh, the revision of Product Liability Directive uh, that uh, I mentioned before, uh, and it is uh, the uh, currently is uh, inadequate for the AI system and the AI Liability Directive. So my uh, research project now, uh, the first part uh, is uh, um, talking about uh, the, um, uh, the interpretation of these different uh, um, regulations. The AI Act is the proposed regulation aimed at regulating AI system, provides mandatory requirements of a pro progressively intensity according to the degree of risk involved about AI system. Uh, there are, in fact, AI systems with intolerable risk and also uh, with high risk and uh, from down to sly risk. Uh, for example, AI systems that I use in hospitals are AI risk uh, with, with AI with high risk because uh, it's close to the health to the right to health, that is a fundamental right. In fact, AI systems that uh, are near close to fundamental right uh, are uh, uh, classified like uh, AI system uh, of high risk, characterized by high risk. Uh, so in 2022, there are two proposals. Uh, we can see uh, two proposals for directives uh, were sub submitted. The first proposing a revision of the previous directive, while the second uh, aims to harmonize the rules on civil liability for damages, for damages arising from AI system. Uh, the two norms have uh, multiple things in common, and uh, here I, I show you a comparison between uh, the, their characteristics. So the scope, the, the, fact, the, the definition of the fact uh, uh, of AI system or the product, uh, and the uh, tool that uh, the EU Commission laid down in, uh, in both of the degrees, so the disclosure of, uh, of evidence. The two norms have uh, points in common. The new uh, product liability directive uh, welcomes uh, to a smart 
products uh, and AI system into its, its scope. So uh, you can apply this directive uh, uh, not only to also with uh, to software and not only to normal pro traditional pro uh, products. Um, uh, but furthermore, both will be able to refer to the requirements of the AI Act uh, to presume the existence of a defect in the system because both refers to AI Act. The AI Act um, obligates the uh, producer or the programmers of the algorithm to uh, some uh, um, uh, requirement for safety or also for uh, um, the instruction that you have to give to people that uh, uh, use uh, uh, or buy uh, this uh, software. Uh, so if the uh, software do doesn't meet these requirements, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can prove a defect. One of the principal problems uh, of AI system is that uh, it's very difficult to find uh, the uh, documentation about uh, how it uh, is uh, constructed or uh, its uh, uh, functioning. So for this reason, one of the, uh, the solutions is the disclosure of uh, uh, evidence. This tool uh, is uh, one to ease the evidentiary, the evidentiary burden uh, to uh, the benefit of injured party in order to reduce the information asymmetry between the, part the parties. Uh, for parties, I intend, uh, I'm talking about who sell the product and who, uh, who buy the product, or also who use the product and injured party because uh, um, then I'm, uh, I uh, show another difference uh, between uh, the scope of the two directives. Uh, you can see also, thanks uh, to this uh, provision, uh, also the, for example, the doctor uh, that use uh, new tool uh, to, uh, for diagnosis or for uh, give a personal, uh, um, personalization of the cure, uh, of the therapies. You can see also the hospital and not who uh, sell or who uh, construct uh, uh, the, um, the um, AI system. However, the ratio of the uh, two disposals are, uh, are different because um, Product Liability Directive emphasizes the role of software as a product or component of another product uh, sold or exchanged in the course of a commercial activity. The directive in the other end, and I can show also the other difference, the directive, on the other hand, is directed to compensate only for damage caused by an output or a failure of an output by an AI system, even if the damage is done indirectly uh, through the activity of the supplier or the user. These last things uh, is the difference that I uh, just uh, uh, show you, because you can also a doctor, but also a uh, who give uh, uh, a public a service using the AI system can be liable for the machine, for the software. However, the AI liability directive has a wider scope of application. It provides protection not only against uh, software suppliers, but against anyone who uh, endangers fundamental rights uh, through the use of AI. Because also, uh, like I said before, fundamental rights uh, or the uh, injuring of a fundamental rights is a, um, is a requirement or is a, a condition to um, classify an AI system like AI system of, uh, uh, with high risk. The main innovation so is the disclosure of evidence, which uh, obligates uh, those responsible for the production, trade, and use of high-risk AI systems to produce uh, mandatory documentation. It's a mandatory documentation because the AI Act now has uh, in uh, a part only for AI high-risk system uh, a documentation that you have, uh, um, you, you have to show or at the moment that you sell the system or at the moment that you uh, 
um, bring the case to the court. And uh, in this way, you have to, uh, to prove that you, your AI, uh, AI, AI system is uh, legal. Uh, obviously, we have to attend the, uh, not the proposed AI Act, uh, but uh, uh, when uh, the parliament lay down the, uh, the definitive AI Act. This makes uh, uh, it possible for the claimant to obtain documentation proving the manufacturer's compliance with the requirements of the AI Act. Uh, also, if uh, um, if uh, um, you, uh, the producer or the user, don't produce these uh, or don't uh, give you the mandatory documentation, uh, these uh, bring, uh, these produce the, um, the presumption of guilt against uh, uh, the person that have to uh, give this documentation. Um, a further difference uh, in seen in the proof of the uh, ca of causation. The product liability directive uh, has retained uh, its no fault approach, so uh, no fault is required in court. Uh, in court, you uh, you don't have to prove the fault of the producer or the fault the fault of the uh, the producer, but. Uh, uh, pro you have to only to prove uh, the uh, product defect uh, and the causal link between the defect and the damage. In uh, such case, uh, the defective uh, will be presumed, but in this case, uh, so thanks to the revision of the product uh, uh, liability uh, directive, uh, the defect will be presumed by a failure to produce the mandatory documentation again. Um, the European Commission wants to um, add this tool uh, and also the mandatory documentation to uh, give uh, the injured party more possibility and more information about the system that uh, caused the damage. Uh, and in this way, only thanks to that documentation, you can uh, uh, ensure the right. Because in other ways, it's, uh, you cannot prove, or it's very difficult to prove the fault, uh, uh, or not the fault, uh, the causal link or the malfunction. Because it's very difficult, like I said at the beginning, to prove that uh, an AI system has a malfunction. Um, so, uh, lack of, uh, uh, for example, uh, with this documentation, you uh, can prove or uh, not prove lack, uh, lack of safety requirements or uh, a close connection between the malfunction and the damage. You can presume, the, so you can presume the uh, causal link uh, and uh, between the damage and the product uh, thanks to uh, this uh, consideration. Uh, in contrast, uh, the AI uh, liability directive requires uh, proof of the psychological element, so of the fault uh, of the producer uh, or the liable party that you identify like a liable party, as a liable party, which may be presumed whenever the liable part fault uh, may be presumed whenever the liable party fails to comply with measures uh, imposed by EU law aim at reducing uh, the risk uh, of the harm uh, complained uh, in the court, in this case, or uh, before the court, we hope. Uh, in both cases, the answer to the difficulties in meeting the claimant's burden of proof are resolved uh, by this disclosure of evidence. Um, there are uh, a common purpose uh, uh, of the two directive uh, because uh, both of the directive uh, want to support uh, the market uh, for new technologies in Europe but uh, uh, also defending the public from the opaqueness and lack of transparency that we uh, show uh, also before, we talk about also before in this uh, morning. E, um, so, uh, uh, in fact, they, they, uh, these two dispositions diverge in the scope, type of uh, liability, and uh, categories of damages. Like I said before, the uh, product liability directive targ targets uh, those harmed by commercial products. Uh, AI liability uh, directive targets uh, automated decision-making process 
productive uh, of an output. So the um, first one, uh, the new product liability directive want to uh, talk about products that you can buy at the supermarket or at market like uh, uh, smart products. Uh, other, uh, instead, the AI liability directive uh, is um, opened to all products, uh, all products uh, that you maybe don't use uh, yourself. Uh, uh, but uh, from other person. So it's uh, a bigger scope, like I said before. Um, product liability directive, uh, um, but product liability directive is an uh, easier instrument for a lawyer, for example, because uh, uh, no fault liability is too, too, too easy to prove because you then don't have uh, to prove the fault. Uh, in fact, uh, the directive states that no fault liability of economic operator remains the only means of uh, the only means um, of adequately resolving the problem of fair allocation uh, of inherent risk in modern technological production. So, what that mean? it means that uh, the no fault approach is the more efficient. Uh, for the public, but the problem is that uh, um, the AI liability directive is a wider scope. You can sue, uh, thanks to that, uh, almost everyone in the uh, chain process uh, of construction, selling, and using the AI system. So uh, you, the choice uh, to uh, ask the injured party to prove the uh, fault is a way to uh, restrict the possibility of uh, uh, suing uh, uh, one of the liable party, and also you have to choose which liable party. You cannot bring all the people in court. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, the AI, uh, AI liability directive requires uh, a showing of fault understood as an act or omission that fails to satisfy the duty of care imposed by union or national law directly intended to protect against the harm that has occurred. Um, another interesting uh, um, theme that uh, I don't uh, analyze for this presentation is the duty of care that you have to prove. So we, uh, the EU Commission, individualized another, another categorized case of duty of, duty of care. And uh, it should be noted that uh, although the Commission opted for a fault-based liability regime, the liability directive, uh, in fact, uh, 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 has uh, also a different uh, purpose uh, in the effect uh, on the national uh, law in the of each member state because uh, uh, it follows a minimum harmonization approach. This approach allows those injured uh, party by AA systems to invoke the most favorable national rules. Uh, those national laws could, for example, maintain the burden of proof, proof prepared by national fault base or strict liability regimes. Does it mean that uh, it uh, also because it's a directive, it's, uh, it's not an act. Uh, each member state, uh, uh, after the, uh, the emanation of this new disposi disposition, can choose how applying, how uh, writing the, uh, their uh, disposition, because uh, it's a directive. Um, it follows that the role of the AI liability directive is not to harmonize duty of care or liability or to create a new tort title, a new tort case uh, uh, of tor uh, new tort case. It's only intended to introduce a facilitated evidentiary burden burdens for, for victims of AI uh, systems. It follows that the directive did not impose a strict liability regime, but allows injured parties to benefit, uh, to benefit from 
disclosure of evidence. So my research in this uh, first part, because I am at least at the beginning of my PhD or at half uh, of my PhD, that uh, uh, when you are a lawyer and you see this case, you can choose from uh, both of these dispositions and you choose uh, um, from the, the, the factual case. If you can prove also default, you may be, if you prove it also default, if you have, uh, you see a damage that is caused indirectly by the AI system, you have to choose the AI liability directive in the way that the national law want to apply that when it comes, or in other way, the product liability directive. I thank you all for the floor, and uh, I hope uh, I give you, I show you the, my idea correctly. And thanks. Excellent, thank you very much. I think again, there are a couple of very interesting points here. Uh, the first one being that uh, we have seen in the previous presentation how technology is evolving, but also we have seen here how legislation is trying to catch up with the evolution of technology, but also how this is not always an easy task. Uh, you were focusing a lot about uh, the burden of reproof, and it is very, it's almost impossible for an individual to prove a regular individual whose uh, life, may, may in some cases, we have seen, for instance, in the United States with the Compass AI system deter determining who has to be released on bail according to the likelihood of risk and who does not, uh, depends, it determines in the um, a decision that determines and increasingly affects the full enjoyment of fundamental rights, of freedoms of individuals. The fact that you can be released on bail or not affects if you <laughs> stay in prison or not. And that is, in, in a lot of countries, is increasingly automated. Uh, this kind of decision, I mean, this is a very, may, may sound an extreme uh, decision, but if you consider, for instance, if a regular people, a regular person who wants to have a mortgage and the banking institution utilizes an algorithmic tool to determine if he is solvable or not, that uh, depends if you can purchase a home or not, if you are considered uh, likely to repay your debts or not by, and again, this, I'm, the point I want to make here is that on the one hand, this may be extremely difficult to explain, on the other hand, it may be extremely difficult for the individual to prove that he has suffered a damage, is what the Romans would have called the probatio diabolica, the impossible proof. We, uh, and uh, we, have we, we have seen here, in also in at the Brazilian level, current proposals that were really suggesting that the individual should prove the harm to be compensated, which would be highly questionable because no individual, regular individuals, do not have a PhD in law and data science to be able to prove they have been a uh, victim of a faulty AI system. And on the other hand, as we were mentioning before with the large language model system is extremely difficult to prove, to, to explain how they function. So the, tr the explicability side of transparency, it's extremely difficult. And fi last but not least, that I think is the second point, we already have laws in place. You were mentioning uh, Article 22 of GDPR. We have a similar Article 20 of the Brazilian LGPD here that allows you to, if you have been uh, if, you, if, if any of your interests have been affected by an automated decision using your personal data to request and to have the right to an explanation. But no one, literally no one, knows how to implement it properly and no regulator knows, and only now in Europe regulators are starting to understand that they need to have data scientists allowing them to understand how algorithmic tools work. In Brazil, this is, comp although it exists in the law, it's completely ignored in practice. So that is my, the second challenge I think the discussion uh, has to also explore. N the fact that we have law does not mean that we are able to regulate society. We are very far from it. So that I think an increasing focus of the discussion should be not only on how to craft the good law, but how to implement correctly the law. Because if we have a nice law and nice authority, doesn't mean that society, the market, uh, and technology will be regulated accordingly. Uh, now, with these provocations, I would like to open the floor for questions. Uh, we have distributed, I, I've seen before, you are distributing little 
cards where you can uh, write your questions. I'm not sure if anyone has already written any. This is a very analogical way of collecting questions, but uh, why not? So if there is any question, please raise your hand so that we can uh, collect them. And I, yes, can, can sh how sh should we organize this? Should I, can we already pass the floor pass the mic to the to the to the floor so that they yeah so that we do, we avoid we maximize uh time for your debate for our debate yes thanks can i uh, well my question is uh, for the erdem i'm martina from the ui um, i work on data flows data regulation so i was very surprised when you say that you cannot process this data because it is public data and uh, also it's is a sensitive personal data the subject is clearly like just putting it out for, for processing. And I was checking now like quickly the GDPR text to make sure, but um, if your profiling does not involve taking a decision for the, the subject for like contracts or similar things, it shouldn't be a problem to process the, the public information about the data subject. So I just wanted to a clarification about what is exactly the, like the, the specific arguments of why you cannot process this data that is available on Twitter. Thanks. Let's collect three questions so that then we can uh, have this final segment of the session. Thank you. Um, my question is to Professor Richard. Um, I found the concept of um, discourse power quite interesting, uh, a new concept for me. And you speak about uh, international discourse power. Um, is there such a concept as local discourse power within a country? Um, and specifically, for example, um, the role of freedom of speech and censorship um, in terms of the amount of localized discourse power. Um, in your talk, you compared the United States with China, uh, saying the United States probably has more international discourse power. But what is the localized internal discourse power of China versus the United States in terms of freedom of speech and censorship? And how does that play out on the global stage? Do we have a third question? Do we have a third question? Otherwise, we can take these two. Yes, we have a third question. Thank you. Um, Yuri Alexandra from Fucus. I have a question for Dr. Yorick. Um, if you could please clarify how to use large language models to help with the privacy issue. Um, I would appreciate. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, very well. Okay, thank you. Um, here's Alexandra from Fiocruz, and I have a question for you that is on the how to use large language models to deal with privacy issues. So if you can please clarify that to me, it it I would appreciate. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first question, it GDPR Article 9 uh, says that a, like processing of personal data uh, spent, uh, I think what you are referring to is Article uh, 92F, uh, 92E, which says that processing relates to personal data which are manifest made public uh, by the data subject. Are you, yeah. So this is really important uh, because, uh, for example, we are trying to extract, we are trying to predict uh, voting behavior. If someone is going to vote for uh, Trump and let's uh, collect uh, tweets from this person and he says, Trump is a good guy and then he says something against uh, Hispanics and then he says something very uh, conservative and in all of this uh, like except for the first one uh, he is not explicitly making it uh, like public that he's going to vote for Trump we are inferring this knowledge from what he is sharing with us I mean if he was saying that 
I will vote for Trump in a very explicit way, it is okay, it is legitimate to process and collect this data. Uh, but we are not actually uh, collecting such manifestly made public data, but we are processing and we are making some inferences that makes it uh, uh, like a, a, a challenging case. So this is not allowed by the GDPR. Huh? Yeah, I mean, because, uh, so we've been discussing about this uh, with our like colleagues, with computer scientists and law professors, so this was an important uh, issue. Uh, and But we can uh, talk about, and I would like to hear your opinions uh, on that as well. Uh, for the uh, language models, uh, so we, we are actually using different, uh, like, I mean, uh, methods, but uh, we are trying to simulate uh, human uh, samples, like uh, if we are uh, talking about Turkey, uh, and if we are interested in understanding a certain uh, group of certain population uh, subgroup in Turkey, then uh, you can ask questions to ChatGPT, for example, uh, the questions that you are asking in uh, in your questionnaire and you can give some specifications and then it can give you some uh, responses. And in this case, you are not dealing with any uh, real individual and you are not identifying any, because the, the problem about anonymization is that it, will, it should be impossible to identify an, uh, an individual, a real individual on the basis of the data that we are collecting from this person. But in this case, we are using a totally uh, synthetic data, uh, which is created by a model, which is based on uh, an entire set of uh, like a, a, the, the text data uh, from the internet. Uh, so therefore, it is totally compliant with uh, GDPR and privacy issues. It, the only thing is that it is, uh, I mean, the only, the main problem is about validity, if these results uh, would be valid. Uh, there's a question addressed to me uh, saying, um, uh, I was talking about international discourse power. Uh, how about the inter how about instead of discourse, international discourse power, how about uh, discourse power is localized? Because discourse power or uh, information flow is censored, is controlled, right? Uh, that's the question, uh, you know, addressed to me. Uh, I fully agree. Discourse power is important for every nation state. So it's, it is not a free flow of information. Uh, the government will not let you to have everything you want. So there is a, a phenomenon what we call the localized discourse power. So that's the first point. Now the second point is um, In today's international relations, it is power struggle <laughs> as the old days in the 19th century, in the 20th centuries. And uh, the power struggle is more uh, reflected in international discourse power or the soft power computation. Uh, now in this soft, soft power computation, uh, it is not about control or conquer other's territory, it is about the minds and hearts of people and how you make people to believe your story, to believe what you're trying to tell, uh, what you're trying to let them to be. So it is competition of over heart and mind 
Now, so information uh, sensor is exists everywhere. Uh, now, in the now we just heard the EEO case. We we heard the U.S. press freedom information freedom, but I can tell you, there's no such things unlimited absolute freedom of information. The media, the government controls information and then they can let you to have the information they want you to have. They still have the influence, the way they leverage to control what you, uh, what they don't want you to hear. Now, talk, taking up, talking about Nordstrom, we, we, we know the, ex the explosion. Nordstrom was bombed, destroyed. Why this time almost the whole Western media becoming silent? Nobody talk about that. There are a few couple of few journalists, brief journalists, tell the story, but the media don't cover them. Right? If this is a censor, if this is a volunteer censor, why collectively silence on these issues? Right? So, you but you can say this is a, this is not censor, this is a, their right to report this or not report this. But I can say, tell you the same things. East and the West information is not absolutely, you know, free of law. So I, I, you know, I've been studying politi power politics a long time. I, that's my belief. <laughs> um, another thing is about um, in 21st century, uh, we are entering the big data age. We are having AI uh, to manipulate processing the data to, to tailor the data for our consumption. Uh, is, this a, is there a digital sovereignty? Should, should the government control <coughs> their digital border to allow certain data to be publicly consumed? Or they, there should be a universal convention about uh, the digital uh, world, about the flow of information? Uh, in the national practice, yes, yeah, somebody, a lot of country actually have uh, firewalls. They control certain, they screen certain data, they control certain data across uh, their border, and uh, the, of course, we need to protect our children. We need to protect, uh, um, you know, our people, uh, keeping them away from certain data. Uh, so, the data. To in my, uh, to my belief, it's not something like oxygen. It is a public good, free, and uh, everybody should freely enjoy it. Data is still resources. It's still a privilege. Data is used for certain purpose. So there is a legitimate right for government to have certain policy and the regulation for the big data, for the data usage, for the data flow across national border. So to some extent, the digital sovereignty <coughs> exists. And then the, th the issue is how we should uh, negotiate to let the data uh, regu relatively free flow for the public benefit, for the human uh, common good, uh, let data um, you know, to be to be used like oxygen, uh, free, enjoyed by everybody. Uh, but um, uh, I f I think uh, uh, now is not the case. Uh, data is not public good. Data a is at some cost. You have to pay that cost, and then somebody still control the data. The big powers, big digital powers still control the data for their, for their usage. And some big companies still for, uh, use that for the uh, commercial benefit as well. Okay, that's my answer. Thank you. Before we conclude, may I just abuse my position as a moderator to provide a little bit of comments to what the colleague from EUI was mentioning about the fact that 
if you, according to GDPR Article 9, if you uh, openly disclose your data, you should, uh, that could be a legal basis to processing that. Uh, two comments, actually. The first one is that that may be at the beginning of a legal answer for a European citizen, but Europe is not the world. And for instance, let me give you a concrete example. If I use ChatGPT, asking, prompting ChatGPT to tell me whatever it knows about Luca Belli, it will you provide an answer that usually, it sounds convincing, but usually has some correct data and a lot of misinformation that the that, run, that sounds reasonable because statistically it makes sense, but may not, may, may be very far from being true. So you may claim if I were a European citizen and if that was based on the information I publicly disclosed on myself, that would be legal. But then you have the, my, the, my previous points about fairness and transparency. There is no mention in ChatGPT about uh, how ChatGPT works and the purpose of it nor there is an explanation of what the user would expect, nor I've ever given any consent to the use of my data as a non, let's say if I am a non-European, to the collection of my data and they use it and even misrepresentation of my data, because that is also a very important point. The fact that the, the, the answers of generative AI like ChatGPT sounds like true, does not mean it is if you ask, for instance, information about your name, you will probably have some, uh, a, 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 a nice paragraph, some paragraphs with some information maybe true, some other that will be completely wrong, and you have never given your consent to that processing, nor to the user, the, the, I, mean, I think you are a privacy scholar, so I think you might know uh, the, re the, the writings of, of Ellen Nissenbaum about contextual privacy, the fact that you disclose something does not on, on publicly, that, don't means that, he, that does not mean that you give automatic consent to any kind of processing of that thing, and that would be a very large misrepresentation of what any kind of data protection law uh, creates as informational self-determination, individual control on, over data. So I think that, yes, what you were suggesting, that there is the possibility to process publicly disclosed information, maybe an initial check of n on legality, but then you also have fairness and transparency that always apply together. So I think that makes it very problematic from someone that designs and utilizes a uh, large language model system. Sorry if I was uh, speaking too much about this. We had a very interesting conversation, wonderful presentations. I'm not sure if the, the papers are already online, but it would, I would be very interested in reading them all. Uh, I hope they will be on the Sun website or somewhere else by our CPDOC uh, colleagues. And so thank you very much for the very good questions, excellent presentation, and please, uh, I think we will have coffee now, yes.
Eu penso que. Penso que é.
Hello, good afternoon. Without further delay, we will start a second round table uh, that will cover how experts are making data science work for social analysis for social sciences. And I would like to welcome the chair session, Professor Dario Oliveira. He's professor at the FGV School of Applied Mathematics. And his research interests include uh, AI, deep learning, sustainability, climate change. So thank you for being here, everyone. Dario. Hello. Hi. So uh, good morning. I guess it's still good morning, almost good afternoon. But <laughs> yeah, it's still morning. Yeah. Um, uh, I was very happy to be invited here. Actually, uh, 10 years ago, I was working at CPEDOC. So I'm, I'm, I, I see some familiar faces here. And it's funny because this session is called uh, it's called data s uh, how to make data science work for social analysis. And I was working 10 years ago, uh, precisely during, I, I was doing my PhD, and I was working precisely with data science applied to, to social to historical database or to social sciences. And so I it's good to see that CPEDOC was already uh, concerned about that 10 years uh, ago. But it's also a bit sad to, to, to see that we are still struggling with that, right? So we're still trying to understand how to how to make data science work uh, for, for social analysis. And, and so in this session today, I think we're going to shed a bit of light on these initiatives and how, how we can make that work, right? So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I, I will begin, I, I won't take uh, any more time, and I will begin with Janice Butler yes. from the European um, University. University Institute. Yeah, and so I'm very curious about, about your talk, so please, the floor is yours. Yeah. Yeah, hi, so my name is Janice Butler and I'm honored to present some of my research here for you all today. So we heard a lot yesterday and today as well about language models and I'd like to here take a step back and just look exactly about how they work and help you, attempt to help you understand um, those language models. So the talk today will follow the following structure. First, I'll explain the current existing approaches that are aiming to achieve the same goal of analyzing language. I'll then introduce you to the technique I've applied in my papers, namely natural language processing, and then I'll illustrate the approach on an example after which there will obviously be time for questions at the end. So we've got the current approach. Um, the classic manual approach of content analysis begins with a design of a set of topics, the development of codebooks for annotators, and a precise documentation for the codebook's use. Annotators are then methodologically trained on a smaller subset of the data and then perform the content annotation. The conformity of their work must, of course, be verified with those of other annotators to achieve an acceptable level of intercoder reliability. A more computational way of analyzing data is the bag of words approach. In its simplest form, the bag of words algorithm counts the number of occurrences of each term, so a word, in a sentence and saves the representation of a sentence as a linear vector of term frequencies. Vectors are then concatenated to a bag of words document term matrix, which can then be used for further input uh, as input for further text analysis. So up there you can see that in our little poem, every single word would be its own vector. As the vocabulary size increases, so does the vector representation of the document. This is then where text cleaning methods are applied, such as getting rid of stop words like a, the, and, etc. And we have stemming and lemmatization. So in lemmatization, for instance, sang and sung wouldn't have the same stem and they wouldn't have uh, the been recognized as having the roughly the equivalent meaning. So to avoid loss of meaning, it may be advantageous to also compound or concatenate the words to a single term. So for example, this expressions of high security and social security may be compounded into one single word um, because security and appearing in both words have the same meaning 
am, but the both compounded words do not. So by compounding one word, we would have an artificial word uh, that would resolve then this incongruity. But that also asks then the question of what do we compound? The bag of words algorithm doesn't take into account the length of the documents being analyzed. For this, the refinement of term frequency time inverse document frequency should be applied. And TFIDF makes use of Zipf's law, which is a statistical incantation that the frequency of any word is inversely proportional to its rank in the frequency table. So for example, the is a very important word occurring everywhere, but it's not that important in the entire scheme of things. So without any pre-processing, the results of bag of words algorithm can be expected to be very poor. Though the fundamental approach is simple, pre-processing becomes cumbersome and uses methods which rely on, for instance, in the case of compounding, on domain-specific knowledge specific to a single language. Word stems may not be equally relevant in all usages, and negation of phrases ought to really be taken account of, as should the role of intensity boosters like very and dampeners such as kind of. The use of n-grams is somewhat unreliably compensate for the negation and booster scenarios, but effects such as synonyms and acronyms, or alternatively the pitfall of words used with double meanings remain unaddressed. But it's important to mention here that the techniques of bag of words and TF-IDF are in fact really powerful exactly due to Zipf's law and work very well in, for instance, spam filters. But the case of irony is, for instance, a great example because somebody might be saying one thing but might mean an entirely opposite meaning. Bag of words has no chance of detecting this and you have to consider the whole entire sentence. And this is exactly why, for instance, humor is so hard to consider, but important in avoiding misunderstandings. So there are many different areas of topic modeling, and the most popular example is the technique of latent semantic analysis, LSA, which is essentially a matrix factorization technique. It takes the bag of words term um, matrix as input, whereby the number of rows is then reduced using singular value decomposition. The documents represented by the columns are compared by taking the cosine of the angle between two vectors. And a result close to one represents then a high document similarity. By grouping similar documents, topic clusters can be formed. And this is a useful intermediate result, particularly when analyzing previously unknown corpora. So, but why would you need uh, natural language models? So there's some consensus that humans are excellent at detecting hidden meanings of concepts and texts, but that computer-assisted text analysis techniques enable much larger volumes of texts and data to be quickly and cheaply analyzed to get an overall but more specific view of a corpus. Thinking back to the pre-processing steps I just told you about, we have to realize that there are several limitations to the semantic precision due to methods that imply, um, re rely on implicit simplifications being applied. So the text first needs to be represented in a more meaningful numeric format before we can then further process it. So let's take a look at a previous project of mine, which can be structured into two clear parts. First, I created a human detection system which I applied then to three types of actors and their social media communication on Twitter. I looked at both the type of humor employed as well as the degree of humor, and then I correlated the use of humor with virality in order to determine how successful the actors are using or not even using humor. But why would you want to do this in the first place? I'm by no means saying that all communication has to be funny, but it's a tool that can really help in attracting attention and building rapport with other people. Because one way or another, it can be applied to great effect in communication. In politics, it's gotten to the stage that politicians are employing joke, joke writers so that they don't appear too drab. In social media, it has become essential to raise one's profile by almost any means. This, doesn't, uh, this even seems to be particularly true for members of the opposition who don't have the voice of a cabinet speaker or a prime minister. 
And one important way of raising one's profile is exactly through the use of humor. Why else would you want to analyze this? Because, well, believe it or not, uh, nobody has, at least as far as I know, ever managed to do much more than analyze whether a text is funny or not. That is okay, but I think it doesn't even begin with helping us deciding, for instance, how to optimize messaging, and it doesn't allow very much differentiation at all in the analysis of how humor is used. While some research has been dedicated to particularly sarcasm, natural language understanding is still missing, and uh, we need a true comp for the true comprehension of language, one of which is, of course, the understanding of humor. So how do you tackle quantifying humor? Well, it's a little similar to sentiment analysis. You could probably attempt to count trigger words, but that then comes with problems of misspelling and context. Um, and what about multiple meanings? So a bank, is that then where you put your money, or is that next to a river? Is it a noun or maybe even a verb? Who knows? But humor is a much more complex system than sentiment. It can almost never be recognized from just a single word. And what about irony even? One thing is said and the opposite is meant. And how about nonsense humor? To begin with, you have to recognize that a statement is deliberate in making no sense and also attempts to do this in a funny way. So humor detection is super complex and we need a different method of tackling those kind of problems. So word embeddings are vector representations of words and their relationships. Semantically similar words are closest to each other and due to the high degree of vectors used, so typically around 300 to 500, many hundreds of relationships are represented within an embedding for each and every single word. The embeddings are created using non-supervised learning from large corpora, so hundreds and thousands of documents and can, due to the unsupervised nature, be created independently of the language of that corpora and still function well for multiple languages simultaneously. Many pre-trained word embeddings are freely available for download. I've listed a couple for you here. Word embeddings also preclude the need for stemming or lemmatization, which I said earlier, since the vector space is able to include all different forms of a word in a meaningful and very compact mathematical way assuming their presence amongst the large amount of training data. Um, word embeddings may also be used for the effective modeling of non-standard semantics, such as emojis or acronyms and even common misspellings insofar as they occur in the significant amount in the corpora. NLMs are then even more sophisticated versions of word embeddings where the word order of the whole entire sentence is taken into context and taken into account. To understand how these models work, we need to consider two concepts, attention and transformers. The weight or attention applied to each word or token is used in predicting what the next word should be, based on the importance of the following input token. NLMs were originally created for language translation when translating a sentence, often it's important to take into account the whole sentence and even an entire paragraph. Long sentences cannot be fluently translated without merely processing word for word for word. Because in different languages, the word order might change around and even the concepts to explain a word might differ. The transformer model is an encoder-decoder framework that relies entirely on the intention mechanism to draw global dependencies between input and output. The sequence-to-sequence -sequence model encodes the input word stream, encapsulating information for all elements in the encoder vector. The decoder, with the help of the information held in the language model, converts then this vector back into intelligible language. NLMs, after pre-training, are rather generalistic. They have a huge capacity for interpreting and decrypting language, but, solve very, uh, but to solve very specific uh, questions, um, in our example of, for instance, humor, there needs to be an additional learning phase, a transfer phase, which is achieved using supervised learning. So as you can see, uh, transformers have come up in recent years. And there have been a lot of models that have been developed in a rather short amount of time. 
there are really um, a lot of NLMs which have cropped up, and some of them you might even know, um, which rely on the GPT architecture, such as Jack, Chat GPT or the predecessor GPT-3, which are able to also generate text. So for the data collection, I had to create my own training data since nobody had done this before. I took multiple sources so as not to make fine tuning too specific. I did some repurposing of existing raw data, but a lot of data scraping from Reddit and of course from Twitter. The annotation of data is a big deal and it took several weeks, um, including the use of MTurk. Once I had the data annotated, I was able to fine tune a variety of models. And I separated humor types into eight different categories, as well as series, which were derived by Ruch et al. And the humor degree was on a scale of one to five, uh, where zero was indicating also non-humorous. So I'd like to just step back and say a few words about the tools which I used, which I think might help you as well. The models and framework are from Hugging Face, so they're French guys based in the US who allow researchers to use their facilities for free. A standard modern PC is quite underpowered for the task, but with Google's Colab Pro, you can access quite high-end GPUs, which are five to 10 times faster, so you don't have to install everything on your computer. Weights and biases was a huge find for me, and enabled me to monitor the fine tuning in real time and also to store my data, all the results and all of the models in a database. And with weights and biases, I could also analyze the results to decide precisely the best hyperparameters for learning and choose the best models to use. So let's take a look at some results. Um, that was a significant point for me where I was able to calculate the precision and recall for each of the models, both for both of the tasks, I trained them independently for humor type and degree, which is nicely visualized here in the confusion matrices. And of course, I have all of the statistics behind it, but we can clearly see by the diagonal line in the confusion matrix that we have a good result here on the left. And for the degree, I was much less pleased, but as we shall see later, the results are still very usable. So now we have the tools to quantify humor. What about the political communication and social science aspects? Here I scraped about three quarters of a million tweets from Twitter for free groups. Politicians, so all of the UK members of parliaments which are on Twitter, which is about 90% of them. Uh, political journalists and as a control group, uh, comedians, because we want to make sure that the Humor Detection actually works. I subjected them to the analysis and correlated them with the metadata from each tweet. So though humor is not often used, there's a very clear picture here that more humor leads to more propagation. For politicians, irony seems to be especially effective. And benevolent humor is quite highly rated but not almost used at all, particularly because it considers also self-deprecating humor in it. Perhaps um, because of that. So as an outlook, I would like to mention my current project, which I'm doing. I'm still looking at Twitter, um, but I'm now investigating the different types of social media engagement, so likes, retweets, shares, and mentions, and relate them to the content. So analyze through those classifiers and posted via a large degree of uh, different actors. So political journalists, again, EU influencers, UK MPs, and EU commissions and committees. I wanted to show you with this brief outlook that there are also other kinds of applications that could be extended from there. So not everything has to be analyzed on social media, even though with the capabilities of analyzing emojis and so on, we can definitely do that. But there are also further applications for political scientists, for instance. Um, in the analysis of manifestos or proceedings of parliament or speeches. And to finish off, I'd like to give you some more findings and uh, practical advice, what I've learned. Most importantly, I think it is in to ensure that you have a high quality of data annotation for fine tuning. So it's better to have less data that is more precise in terms of, for instance, binary classifiers you can get away with about three to 4,000 example data. 
poorly annotated data just definitely reflects in the F1 values and in the quality of your model. And as always, high values for intercoder reliability are essential, just as in manual content analysis. But as soon as you have fine-tuned a model, you can use it over and over again with the same confidence for a massive amount of data. To understand this, we need to see that machine learning is a complex statistical model of very high dimensions. We can derive information from these models um, that is very powerful due to their high dimensionality. We're not reading off a number of straight XY line graphs of a curve, but we're reading effectively hundreds of thousands of curves, potentially, and simultaneously correlating them. So it's not just black magic in a black box, it's just very complex statistics. And it's so powerful because we have the inherent language intelligence of those large language models, but we can fine tune them to a layer or layers of neural models for our purposes, whatever you decide to do with them, humor or any other kind of content analysis. The power of having a reliable classifier definitely is in its speed and about 100 inferences is typical. Completely consistent, in con uh, consistent intercoder reliability is another point. It's not perfect, but it always upholds the original precision of the model. It's also ideal for future use, so future reuse of other projects to fine tune once and use it many times. So for instance, I'm using in my outlook like I explained, I'm using also human analysis there again because I have the model. You can also use it in combination with other classifiers and to be able to improve the quality of future classifiers with pre-classification of training data, which um, can simply uh, simplify annotations down to fewer even binary choices. So it's most powerful when training data contains a lot of topics which otherwise tend to overwhelm and confuse annotators. So I hope I've been able to give you an insight more into what I've been doing and to help you understand language models a bit better. Um, if you have any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So that, that was very, very interesting. <laughs> so I don't know about you guys, but I like a lot. Um, uh, I don't know if we have, we do the questions at the end, right? Or yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, because me, myself, I have, I have some questions and some curiosities and, and all that. But thank you, thank you a lot. It was very, very nice, very interesting presentation. Uh, and one thing that is, that is important is that, I mean, I know that sentiment analysis is already a challenge, but irony is another level of, <laughs> of challenge. So it's, it's great that you're working with that. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a challenge. So now we are going to uh, to invite Marcus Salgado to, uh, to the floor. He's assistant professor in our the School of Economics here at, at, at uh, the foundation. So are the slides now? Mm, I think uh, it's 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 off. I saw I saw an app that you can you can. No, no, but I, I thought I saw them before. Uh, oh, sorry. I thought I saw him before, but uh, yeah, I thought he was lower up away. I can't see it, but uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> this is the one that says on page one. <laughs> sorry, I, I thought they were already up here. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. And the title of this presentation is the Dynastic Marriages and War, and this is joint work with the, my co-authors Antonella Bandiera and Valentin Figueroa. Um, thank you very much for being here. This is a pretty pre preliminary work. We still have a lot to do, so any any uh, suggestions or comments or objections are welcome. 
So I'm going to start uh, with a bit of, of motivation and why would we care about uh, war in, in Europe. Now my, my paper is going to focus on uh, dynastic marriages, which I'm going to define in a second, and war in Europe uh, from the 1400s to the early 1900s, so 1918. Um, and there's a, there's a long literature in sociology and history that says that the uh, European states wage war frequently against, uh, against their neighbors and they were relatively uh, stable internally. And these two facts have been linked to uh, the development of strong states. So European states fought each other a lot, were relatively uh, stable internally, and they end up taxing a lot and having uh, significant control over the population. And of course, there's this is a huge literature about st uh, state capacity in Europe, and there's a lot of stuff I'm leaving out, but just as this is just a way to motivate why would we care about um, what led to uh, internal stability and external war in Europe in the state formation years. No? So I'm going to talk about dynastic marriages now. Dynastic marriages we define as the marriage between uh, um, uh, two people from different royal houses that are ruling different countries. No? Um, and we, we are going to argue that these dynastic marriages contributed to frequent external wars or more frequent external wars. And uh, this is more a hypothesis we couldn't test yet, but may have contributed also to a relatively uh, more uh, internal stability. No? So what we're going to say, and this is kind of the key phrase, the only thing I need you to know about these presentations is that we're going to argue that this uh, marriage between different royal families, so these marriages to foreigners, let's say, uh, displace succession conflicts uh, from the domestic to international arena. No? And this is, a, this is an example. For example, this is an example from the War of the Hispanic Succession. So Charles II of Spain died without heirs, no? and he had no sons and no daughters. Um, and, but his two sisters uh, were married to the King of France and the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, and then this, this conflict, this uh, dynastic conflict on who was going to be King of Spain became a, basically a war war that in all of Europe and in the Americas too. No? And like uh, these, these dynastic claims were very important. No one would get to be, no, no one else except these two contenders uh, had hoped to be uh, King of Spain. Uh, so if maybe these two women had been married to like Spanish noblemen, this could have been a, like a civil war in Spain instead of like a, an international war. And we will show that this is more like a general phenomenon. So just to, to talk about uh, why would we expect dynastic marriages to, to lead to peace or war, um, I, I want to say that the, 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 the standard opinion seems to be or from our papers or, or or the way people talk about history is that they, they seem to lead to peace, no? Or like that's what the kind of expectation people seem to have and why our results may be counterintuitive, no? Um, having a marriage between two different royal houses ruling different countries may lead to feelings of reciprocity. For example, if I'm, you know, if I'm the king of Spain, I'm not married to the kings of France uh, uh, sister, I may not want to go to war against my brother-in-law because of this feeling of reciprocity. Um, it may facilitate information flows. It's easier we now have this person in common who can help us talk these things out. Um, people think also think of these marriages as like hostages. I mean, this is a kind of bleak way to think about things, but it's usually a first thing like, you know, economies we talked about kind of come up with is like, oh, you know, I have a family member living with me, so you are not going to dare to, uh, you know, declare war on me. Uh, I think historically that doesn't seem to be the case, but or that they were treated as hostages, but uh, that's another potential channel. But on the other hand, and this is, I think, the only the only place we found our argument uh, in history or in philosophy, it's um, for, uh, this paragraph from uh, Erasmus of Rotterdam. Uh, he says, like, from these children, the children from these dynastic marriages, uh, come the greatest of change in kingdoms for the right of rule is passed from one to the other. No? And something is taken from a place and added to another and the result is then making wars more frequent. He's saying basically the same thing we're saying. And he says in a paragraph in passing, but it's, it's our whole paper. 
uh, that basically you are messing with succession disputes, um, and and then you are this is worse, where uh, wars uh, ensue, no. So it w this is why. So this is why we're gonna try to talk about the causal effect of these dynastic marriages on war. Um, so so we're gonna I be interested in this like causal effect, no. So to do this, we're gonna we're gonna build a data set. Uh, is they are state dyads, so pairs of states, uh, going from 1480 to 1918, uh, and we linked it with data on aristocratic genealogies and wars. Um, given the nature of the Panama area, I should have talked talk more about this, but uh, uh, this is, we think these uh, genealogical data sets, I mean, we use it for European, um, uh, like kind of is a genealogical is an European nobility, but more generally a genealogical data set can be used more. Like we can, you can construct a genealogical data set uh, with, with current tools and, and get a lot of research, uh, get a lot of uh, stuff out of it. Um, so, uh, this is not, sorry. Sorry, this is not working. Sorry, can someone? Oh, sorry. I don't think it works. Oh. Oh, I think that maybe press a key. <laughs> I think it's just <laughs> working slowly. Okay. Um. So, um, so we had this data set, and we could do just a progression. You know, we could see the correlation between uh, where a pair of states that had a marriage between them um, was more likely to be at war uh, or not. Uh, so we can see, you know, in the year 1700, these two states had a marriage between them. Were they more likely to have a war that year, or you know, in the 50 years after? Um, So uh, this that progression could obviously be biased, no? There are a lot of things that uh, could affect war and marriage at the same time. You know, there could be that, uh, it could be biased in both directions. Uh, um, okay, uh, so that, that progression could obviously be biased. Um, for example, states that are just more likely to be at peace because they just finish a war they uh, may sign up a peace treaty and, and celebrate a marriage to, to sign the peace treaty. Um, that's pretty common. States that go to war often may use the marriages to sign peace treaties, but then because th there are states that go to war more, uh, they're more likely to, to be at war again. So that's a kind of a bias in our favor. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, we w so we're gonna try to have a, a research design that avoids these sort of, of obvious biases, no? And we're gonna exploit some characteristics of this uh, European uh, marriage market. This is not early modern; it's not early modern; it's modern European marriage market. Um, uh, the first one is, is, is quite obvious. It's like uh, sex, same-sex marriage was not allowed. So the Queen of England had only sons, and the Queen of Spain had only daughters. They couldn't celebrate a marriage between them. And this is uh, potentially random, and this is kind of, I'm gonna explain how this helps. And also there's a sort of mating by, mating by age, so spouses pretty, uh, had similar ages, no? So since sex at birth is random, or these rulers cannot uh, decide on the, on the sex of their, of their children, uh, they cannot coordinate their births just to have a, a dynastic marriage. So this is a, source of exogenous variation that's gonna allow us to identify an effect. No? And this is gonna be an instrumental variable design, so we're gonna use this randomness to uh, get uh, some exogenous variation in the probability of marriage. No? Um, so we're gonna build this uh, exogenous instrument. Uh, we're gonna use the analogical data on the entire European aristocracy. Uh, for each ruler, we'll find their core family, so this is siblings or children, and for each pair of ruling families, 
and we will calculate the number of compatible matches between them, you know? Um, and we will define this as the a number of uh, male and female pairs with an age difference that goes from, we call it minus five to 20, because uh, m this is what covers like, I think 95% of all marriages. So all 95% of all marriages had an age difference that went from minus five, so the men being five years younger, to uh, 20, which is uh, the male men being 20 years older. But this is just because of the 95, you know? Uh, we need to define this some way, but this is robust to whatever we choose. The, the results don't change it. Because the, the, the ages differences are, are closer than what you may think. Um, um, so these are gonna be the, the, the estimation, which basically we're gonna uh, uh, run a regression that uses this measure of comparative couples and used it to uh, get a number of predicted marriages. So how many marriages would we expect you to have given that you had this many compatible couples? And then using these predicted marriages, so uh, this variable that only uses exogenous information to predict, to where to see where that predicts for, no? Um, we'll have fixed effects, so, so this is gonna be uh, like a, what would, uh, uh, we call a different difference uh, estimation. So we're gonna uh, control by, by shocks uh, that um, occur uh, by, by year and also by, by per fixed effect. So this is gonna be how much the probability of war deviates from the average probability of war uh, for that pair of states, no? Um, and we, more importantly here, we're gonna control by the size of the family because if you have a larger family, you can have more compatible pairs and larger families may have other effects on, you know, the probability of war. Um, so, uh, another important thing is that we're gonna use imputed age of death because um, deaths could have an effect on their own and they are gonna mechanically affect uh, the number of compatible uh, couples. So we're gonna only use birth data and just gonna keep everyone alive in our data set for 60, 70, or 80 years with the robustness. So the, the assumptions is, is that uh, we have that sex at birth is random, that rulers cannot coordinate births, um, and that this is a variable acts as if random after controlling for the, for the size of royal families, no? Um, so I'm gonna talk about results and to take less of your time. Um, this is the table uh, the, of the first stage, so compatible couples as you could expect, the kind of, uh, mechanically predicts uh, the uh, prob uh, increases the probability of marriage between royal houses. Um, what uh, basically one standard deviation in compatibility increase, it's like increasing like two percentage points the increase of marriages, which is big, it's like 86% of the mean. The, the problem, let's say, with that makes this data a bit noisy is that um, you have a lot of pair of of countries that had no marriages, no? Uh, so even though the, the ratios, which is what's important here is, uh, when you have compatible couples, yes, you are way less likely to be married, so there are no, uh, m almost no uh, uh, marriages uh, betwe between people who have no compatible couples, but you are gonna have, of course, a lot of the opposite situation. Uh, people who have compatible couples, but they don't have a marriage. Because the thing is there's a limited number of people who you can be married to, you know? So that kind of mechanically limits how many marriages you can have. So um, the, the, the main effect, this is the first, uh, the first stage. This is the main effect, the effect of marriage on war. Uh, I'm gonna interpret it in the next slide. There's a very large effect, positive effect of these uh, marriages on war. Um, uh, m a, a diets that are, are married are 30 percentage points more likely to be at war, which is eight times the mean, it's a huge effect, but the estimates are very imprecise. So this, we get a significance uh, here, different than zero. People got away with this uh, from very long in, in instrumental uh, variables, but uh, using the very 2022 T ratio adjustments we should use and the kind of what's the latest on the, on the instrumental variable literatures, uh, we, in, we cannot reject the null. So we could reject the null before we saw this paper when we started writing this paper in 2021, but now we kind of realizing that 
we kind of need more power. We need either to extend our sample or, or do other things to more precisely estimate these effects and, and we are thinking of how to do that. Um, so there's a lot of things we can do. I, I don't wanna, these are a few of our ideas. Uh, maybe having a lot of inconsequential diets, you know, like having Bulgaria and Portugal being in the, in the, in the as, a, as a potential uh, pair maybe adds a lot of noise and, and we can get rid of those. Um, so um, we also have some evidence that uh, marriages increase war with third countries, um, yeah, you know, so just, uh, but anyway, that's uh, secondary. We wanna, uh, because since our hypothesis is that this uh, displays the, um, the, the focus the, of succession disputes to international arena, we wanna try something on civil war too, but we, it's really hard to define civil war in this period or, or to get a data set, a comparable data set. Um, anyway, this is another example. This is the war of the evolution that also involves, this is, sorry, this is the, um, this is the, the same example I gave before, the, the war of Spanish secession uh, and the sisters of Charles II of Spain marrying to the king of France and, 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 the, and the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, so just to give a conclusion, uh, uh, you know, marriage is a leading cause of divorce, that's what my, my co-author like to say all this paper, um, and, and this interconnection multiplies the possibilities of conflict, no? Uh, and basically our, our, main con our main hypothesis, let's say, is that uh, dynastic marriages allow the uh, European rulers to, to export succession disputes, and, and this may have promoted internal order because then you ha don't have succession disputes with local nobles, but you have it with international rulers, no? And these are two, this uh, internal order and international conflict are two important factors that, you know, historians and sociologists uh, interpret as important factors for, for state building, no? And also an important thing is that these social norms that, you know, who can get married to who could be sh shaping, you know, uh, warfare and we need to like more, to study more this, this connection. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's all, thank you very much. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, so, so thank you, thank you, Marcus. Uh, it, it is, it is very interesting to see how div diverse this <laughs> this session actually is, uh, and it's it's also funny to to, to see that uh, he's actually approaching another problem that's com it's a common problem in data science that is basically having a very small da data set, right? And how to do with the statistics when you have such a small data set? We have a problem that is just realized very few times and then how to handle that. So this is another big problem also for data science. So uh, now I, I invite Skalk. I don't know if I know how to pronounce that. I, I try. Yeah. Stupid, yeah. Van der Merve, he's from the Stellenbosch University. And yeah, it's going to be another totally different topic. So it's going to be a, a rich session. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I was recently at another conference um, that was really just a, a focus group of academics that were slightly out of my field and they were real hardcore musicologists working in Africa and um, I also work on music but I started talking about but you must look at data you know you've got to look at the digital aspect of this and I was kind of outside of the the core discussion there now I come in as well I'm not a data scientist, but I bring my thoughts uh, to you. Uh, it's already been um, illuminating for me. Um, my focus here is on things like culture and identity. And um, which is th 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 these are challenging themes, but also how they stand in relation to phases of societal change, like digital disruption. Um, and also how that stands in relation to uh, social structures of power. All, s all things considered, I, I'm looking at this against the background of uh, the continent of Africa where um, things like digital lives, uh, the way people spend their times online is maybe sometimes different than the rest of the world. Africa is late in terms of internet penetration compared to other territories and um, Considering this also against the 
background of the social realities of Africa, like its colonialism and um, the post-colonial state, how does this, all this play in? And I always fall back, um, when I look, consider popular culture, um, I like to uh, look at the work of Karen Barber. Um, just quote, when looking at popular culture in Africa, specifically, uh, popular cultural forms not only emerge of his, out of historical change, but also participate in it. I'm not going to read that whole quote for you. you. You are literate as well. You can read it. Um, but I want to just focus on, for a historian, therefore, new popular cultural form as a double life, as an object of historical inquiry, but also as one of its sources. Changes in popular culture also herald changes in society. How do we translate the changes that the digital world brings to uh, the actions of people as a force of historical change and a force of change in popular cultural practices. Taking that further, I look at popular music specifically um, and how it interacts with identity. Uh, there I want to quote um, um, Andy, um, Andy Bennett. Contemporary sociological work on music and identity has been concerned to look beyond the significance of socio-cultural responses to music as a reflection of the structural conditions underpinning social relationships in a given social context, and to recast music as a resource through which individuals negotiate such structural forces and engage in the co-production of their social cultural identities. Music does not only reflect the society, um, it is an ingredient that people use to construct their identities as they go through life. Now, if you combine these two, just on a theoretical practice, and look at the next part, this is some of the latest statistics in terms of internet penetration in Africa. Um, you can see where the, the spots are, who's more connected than others. Um, it's obviously increased quite a bit in the decade since 2010 and up to now. It's obviously going a bit further. Combine that with uh, the data on uh, unique uh, subscribers and mobile data, because again, um, it's through mobile phones that most people access the internet in, in Africa. I don't know what the stats are in other territories, but there are many factors why that is the case. But we are currently standing at, uh, at around 600 million unique users of mobile data on the continent of, with a population of about 1.3 billion. But this is where it gets interesting. That's the median age of the Africa's population compa compared to the rest of the world. I think that, that's a, a slightly optimistic number, that 18. I think it's actually a bit more, 19.3 or 19.3 and 19.8. But a few factors combine here. Africa's users of the internet are young. And there are many. And more and more of them are becoming connected. So their consumer patterns would arguably perhaps be different than other continents and other territories. But the African reality is just some things uh, to consider. Connectivity is still an issue. Um, but, but you have many competitors rolling out the infrastructure to get access to new territory. So as we speak, more, more people are beginning connected to the internet in Africa. Two, high data costs. Um, at a stage, data in South Africa was four times the price of what it was in the U.S., if you could think about a population that does not have a lot of cash, data, access to data is limited in that sense. But data costs are coming down as well. It's another barrier to entry out of the way for people to actually go online. Um, another thing is uh, limited smartphones. Uh, Apple has very little penetration outside of South Africa. iPhones are just too expensive. And this is an interesting point because um, a Chinese company, or a trans, a Transnet, the parent company, they um, they're the world's fifth largest uh, mobile phone manufacturer, and they zeroed in especially 
on the African market. They have smartphones with Amharic alphabets for the Ethiopian market. They have phones that are designed to have a two-week-long power, um, bat battery power. If you're out herding your cattle and you don't have electricity, they, they, <laughs> they cater for that. Um, so they are the continent's most popular, of the producer of the continent's most popular brands of cell phones. And this is where it's, this is where, uh, this is where it, it became very interesting to me. Um, Transnet uh, with the techno phone, that's what it's called. They've got an embedded music streaming platform on it called Boomplay. They've got a cheap Chinese made uh, smartphone that's got access to the internet and it's got a music streaming platform and it's got loaded uh, content on there and you can listen to that for a freemium model. Um, I'm going to skip that part. But I just wanted to just put in perspective because I'm trying to understand how do African youth spend their time online and on what? And I'm interested in music because I think there's something there that's something that validates looking at it. Just look at the numbers. Twitter in Africa has got about 22 million users for the whole continent. YouTube Music's got more than 130 million. Boomplay, with the embedded platform on the Chinese uh, smartphones, you can't always trust the data, but say somewhere between 70 and 90 million or 95 million users, most of them in Nigeria. We don't know TikTok. There's a Nigerian streaming platform, Audio Mac, that's got about 20 million active users. That's as big as Twitter in Africa, and so forth. The interesting thing is, stats show that um, on these platforms, African young people stream mostly African music. They've got catalogs, they can listen to Ed Sheeran or whatever, they can listen to uh, whoever from around the world, but they tend to listen to local or African music, but across territories. Now, I'm a historian. I want, to, I want to place this on a trajectory of technological development and how does, how does it stand in the history of since people started listening to so, uh, cultural artifacts that could play music. For instance, the beginning of the gramophone record. You didn't need to be at a concert to listen to music. You could actually just sit there if you've got a gramophone player. Then radio came. It was broadcasting. And as the infrastructure of radio broadcast spread out, it became a conduit for, obviously, popular cultural things and music culture, but also all sorts of other disruptors in society. Television came late in Africa. In South Africa, it was only introduced in the 70s, but it had a massive social impact as well. And all of these disruptions also played their role in oftentimes destabilizing power structures in society. Um, you have elements, historical elements, that made it difficult for certain people to have access to the modes of production to produce music that will be broadcasted over the radio. Um, you have factors such as censorship, for instance. Um, I did a lot of work on apartheid um, radio broadcasts um, and about 55% of all submitted music was censored by the um, state broadcaster. You had many other territories in Africa that had the same kind of censorship. But all of them fade away. Music production now is easy and cheap. If you have a phone in your bedroom, you can create a hit song. You can upload it to a digital streaming service. There's nothing between you and fame, theoretically. The result, I went and counted. Before the digital era, taking a South African example, between 1986 and 1996, 1,619 songs were submitted for playlisting on the broadcaster, of which 55% were turned down for various reasons. Spotify, which is only one streaming platform today, is receiving between 2,000 and 4,000 songs per week. So you can imagine how that catalog is spreading. There's no censorship. Uh, we talked about firewalls in a previous conversation. Many African territories lack the infrastructure to put up these kind of firewalls. 
So it is, there's, no, there's no barrier to what people can consume. And that's, that is critical. I want to give you an example. I'm not going to play the, the, the music video. This is a song, uh, Jerusalem. I don't know if anybody knows this song. Uh, it's a song in Isizulu. It's South Africa's most spoken language. The genre is Ama Piano um, uh, by Master KG featuring Nom Trebo, who just won a Grammy Award. Congratulations. Jerusalem became, it, it was released in 2019, South African song. And a group of rural people in Angola made a YouTube video where they just started dancing to it. They created their own dance move, and that went viral. A year later, Jerusalem had, was actually one of the, mo the most streamed songs in the world on Spotify. It's got 515 million views on YouTube. It's got 200 million views of that original dance challenge. And you can just go check um, its digital impact, how it is consumed, and its territories where it is consumed. It's, it's just one example, but I want to quote one of the um, Spotify Africa executives. Uh, it's one of the top saved songs in what we are curating right now. Keyword is curating. That's generally how we know a song is successful. When a fan engages with a song, you're judging things like whether they're skipping, whether they're just listening to the first 30 seconds or 20 seconds, or whether they're saving. Saving means they are that committed to it. And there's been an incredible, incredible amount of saves. They know how long you listen to song, and how often, and what time of the day you are listening to that. So how do di digital streaming platforms work? Um, they obviously need to constantly grow their monthly active users to be successful. That's on the one hand. They do that through playlists. They use AI to see what kind of songs are often listened to. What kind of sound doesn't grab people's attention? And you combine that with um, editors, human editors that combine that with the AI and their own experience and they create and curate new playlists. And once you become popular, the chance, chances are that you will get po be, stay popular. Sorry. Um, popularity breeds popularity. And that's got a lot of consequences that I hope will resonate with some of the themes that we've been talking about. Because over time, um, they build up a recipe for making successful playlists. It's the, it's the intellectual property of each of the different streaming platforms. Sometimes they refer to it as the secret sauce, which I think in current companies probably not nearly academic enough uh, a term. But it does bring us to a crucial question. What is in the secret sauce? But more importantly, how much is culture determined by content? And how much is content determined by culture? Um, you are all data specialists, you know what kind of data is out there. These digital streaming platforms know how old you are, where you are, how long you listen to a certain song. Do you listen to this song and skip it after 20 seconds? Do you put that song on repeat? Um, when do you listen to that? And it's, it's, it's unprecedented insight if you're an anthropologist studying music behavior, but it's also, more importantly, it allows us to actually map out what Simon Frith has called aesthetic communities, people that are part of cultural groups and um, cultural practices in the online world that transcend national, linguistic, and even regional borders. Um, how, do you, how do you approach this? Just for an, just an example, I just want to pause there. Streaming platforms can tell me that a 19-year-old Swahili-speaking woman in Dar es Salaam is listening to a rapper from Nigeria 
who speaks Yoruba. There's, it's a different linguistic community. It's a different geographic area. And they might even be a religious. Uh, she might be Muslim. He might be Christian. There are a lot of uh, cross um, uh, pollination that's happening. So, but it's difficult. I'm not. I'm, I don't come from data science, so it's difficult to, you know, to, to gauge and I hope I, I, to get some suggestions. But the methodology is available to better understand the impact of these uh, things. Um, so far, you can, if you are an artist and you have music on a play or on a uh, platform like Spotify, you get your data. I'll just explain to you how that works. You know when someone listens to your music and where they are and all that. You've got that data, but an outsider does not. So you can go interview artists and artists and artists and try and see what you can get from that, but that's the long route. Yeah, it's kind of an ethnographic study as well. You can use uh, case studies in that sense. Uh, use, you can also um, go to a specific geographical location and have um, you know, interviews there. Digital streaming platforms won't give you your, their data. It's their IP. There are also limitations and legal limitations to that. So that's a problem. You can go to record labels. Um, you can data scrape sites like YouTube for you know information on comments. Um, that's got its limitations as well. Ethics, the privacy laws in Africa also vary from ter territory to territory and they are still quite a few steps behind the territories that we have been talking about. So there are a lot of things to consider. I just want to give you one example of an uh, interview that I did with an artist uh, who's had three number one albums on Spotify, South Africa, and how they use their data. Um, they do very well. Uh, they are s gaining, getting more income from streaming than from CD sales. Um, and they need to keep on producing to have a large catalog that people listen to. They just booked a tour of Australia because they saw that they had specific listeners in Brisbane, in Perth, in Melbourne, and Sydney. They didn't go through a middleman. They booked the venue themselves, and they have sold out before they even left. So that's great. They can also see which of their songs don't work. So they won't write those kind of songs in the next al for the next album. Another one, uh, another example, I interviewed uh, one of the executives of Spotify South Africa, who's got some insight into the different uh, behavioral patterns of different, uh, I would say, uh, ethnic groups in that sense, and linguistic groups. Um, you could see that in, for instance, those people who listen to Afrikaans, which is generally a population that's got a higher spending power than the rest of, of the population, tended to listen to uh, Afrikaans music peakly on Saturday afternoons and evenings. Where, and they, are, um, they normally tend to buy the premium Spotify version that doesn't have ads and those kind of things. Compare that with uh, Amapihana, which is a much broader um, following in townships, people with a lower socioeconomic status that would rather go for the freemium model, but they listen to Amo Piano all week, all day long. What does that tell us? Are they working in environments where they still can listen to music while they're working, or are they in white? You know, what are the dynamics there? I just also want to take one last example. Um, how music crosses linguistic barriers there's a group, currently the most streamed Afrikaans group, called the Temple Boys. They're from uh, the Cape Flats. It's it's uh, s lower socioeconomic income area outside of Cape Town. They rap in a dialect of Afrikaans over uh, um, another genre called Krum, which is a it's a Zulu genre that's uh, very popular in townships outside of the Afrikaans-speaking community. But because they combine language and style to something new, it's an incredible, successful um, recipe. One last example, 
Uh, uh, I went to, to look at a, uh, a song by a guy called Burner Boy. He's from Nigeria. He's currently the, 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 large, the most successful music artist in Africa. He released a song called Common Person uh, four weeks ago. It's got 13 million views. There are almost 10,000 comments. I just wanted, I just took the first 10. Because he's Nigerian. He's from an Anglophone country. Um, so, sorry, Scott. Yeah. We're just a bit behind the, the schedule, so I don't know if... Confusing okay. to follow. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, is, um, there are South African listeners. There are Zimbabwean listeners. There are listeners from Senegal and listeners from Sierra Leone. That's just four in ten. There are people from... Uh, uh, commenting in French, which is outside of the Anglophone world. He also releases political songs, which brings us to a conclusion. I hope to have given you just some crumbs of food for thought. Um, what we see here is an unparalleled disruption in the history of music consumption and distribution. It is essential for people like me who study popular music to consider this and, and not tr traditional um, areas of, of um, study. That's one. Um, access to the data is limited and still remains a challenge. Um, but thinking about the larger picture, if we have conversations about post-coloniality, identity and power. The distribution of these uh, cultural products, if you want to call them that, cultural artifacts, songs, that transcend traditional cultural boundaries and regions and ling languages, it is uncensored. More and more young people are partaking in it. It becomes more and more something that they um, consume on a daily basis for the whole day. They are very much involved in this. How does this play in into our concepts of identity and power? Um, I'll leave the ethical part out at the end. Thank you very much. So thank you, thank you, Scott. So now just not as to get so behind the, the schedule call, um, Juliano Basta, right? Yeah, thank you from the um, the Luis University, right? Is it okay? Thank you, thank you very much. So good morning, or also afternoon, almost afternoon to everybody. And I am Giuliano Vosa, which is the last of the three names you see here on the screen. The other two are unfortunately absent, they have to work at, in Rome, in Italy, and in some other things. So I, I hope I will be at the height to present our project, which is still at the beginning. Um, but I hope really I will, I will make a few, at least an impression of what we are trying to start working on. Okay, first of all, I come after uh, humor, um, dynastic marriages and African music, so proportionality doesn't sound really attractive to your ears and I personally completely agree with that. Plus, as a lawyer, which I am, a public law lawyer, mm, I have a reputation for not being familiar with data and numbers at all, which is another thing. <laughs> You know that in Italy, but not only in Italy, normally when somebody is asked why he chose the law faculty, the main answer, the most given answer, and that's a statistic that works, is because mathematics were not involved in the program of studies. Okay, so the idea is that we are trying to develop at least some legal concept and then understand how data will work on the basis of that concept and how data will influence the shape of those concepts that have been worked at large in law doctrine. So the idea is that climate change protection, which is a very novel thing in public law, uh, in public law world, can be furthered, enhanced by data science. More particularly, data science can support what we are trying to call a prognostic proportionality scrutiny. 
I'm not sure you're familiar with what a proportionality scrutiny is, so I try to give you a very brief overview of what proportionality looks like. So let's say that proportionality is a legal tool deployed in courts by judges, especially constitutional judges, in order to measure the extent of legitimate power, a power which is already deemed as legitimate, to which extent it can go when balancing different rights and interests. So the proportionality scrutiny goes as far as saying that a legal measure is proportionate, then consistent with the constitutional, when it is apt to reach the objective, what is called the idoneity test, necessary to achieve that objective for the least burdensome means prior criterion, and commensurate as for the burdens entailed to achieve that objective, which is the stricto sensu proportionality scrutiny, as we call it in constitutional law. So as proportionality measures the exercise of legitimate power by offering reasons to justify public actions, it balances different legal positions, rights, and interests towards what we call a reciprocal optimization, which means the best possible level of satisfaction for all the rights and interests at stake, commensurately with their weight. And what this weight is, is the, is the, the legal question that is underneath our point. The idea is that spreading off a culture of justification needs finding reasonable answers to what is proportionate, especially when it comes to actions that have a relevance in climate change, actions that may influence climate change in a bad way or in a good way if they are, if they are actions that mitigate or implement uh, actions at the time against climate change. So, What happens if proportionality as a tool to understand who has the right to do something and who has not that right is deployed with regard to future legal positions, meaning legal positions whose factual background is not currently determined? Such a, such a scrutiny would have to consider future projections of a legislative act. It would have to say what a legislative act's objectives are and how they will be shaped in the future. It must question the plan behind, the rationale behind a legislative act, not only with regard to today, but also to regard with what will happen. Then, in order to do this, it will have to consider all the events, empirical events, that happen throughout times as part of the legal evaluation. As lawyers say, they will have to consider as law facts like events coming up. Then they have to take into account future events and then to take into account acts of other public authorities whose range of action lies beyond the state, the state of which the constitutional judge is part of. And at the same time, that constitutional judge must consider as its own challenges claims coming from outside the boundaries of the states it belongs to. So the territorial boundaries, which give name to jurisdiction, are really toughly put into question by this kind of scrutiny. And it is a very tough question for lawyers, since jurisdiction, as everybody understands, is one of the main topics which defines the characteristic of a court and of the law this court applies. So. Our, let's say the most inspirational case in this regard is a case arisen before the German Constitutional Court. German Constitutional Court has a strong reputation for being a very doctrinal based court. So they are very much referring to what a doctrinal constitutional elaboration of concepts is in light of the German tradition of public law. And then they are quite pioneeristic in what they call the protection of new rights and interests by shaping the concepts that they have been creating at large. I mean, not only they as judges, but the German constitutional doctrine has helped to forge in the last at least three centuries, I would say. So German constitutional court is one of the most powerful court and is also one of the most active in protecting these new rights, especially these new rights and interests that arise as, that arise as a consequence of the climate change. So let's give just some constitutional background to, the, to those that are unfamiliar with German constitutional law. Article one of the German constitution begins with a very famous sentence which says that human dignity is unbelievable, unbelievable. 
and to respect and protect it shall be the duties of all state authority. Then you see that the German people therefore acknowledge the inviolable and inalienable human rights as the basis of every community, and those rights will bind the legislatures, the administrative offices, and the government. Then Article 2 deals with personal freedom. They say that every person shall have the right to free development of his personality insofar as it does not violate the rights of others or offend against the consistent order of the moral law. Every person shall have the right to life and physical integrity. Freedom of the person shall be unviolable. These rights may be interfered only with personal privilege. All this construction shall is useful to determine that the human person is at the center of the German constitution and as a human person, it may hardly refer only to German citizens, but to human persons in general, given the empirical evidence that persons must be considered everywhere as persons. So there's no difference between German citizens and elsewhere citizens. This is very important in our reasoning, because it helps proportionality to transcend the boundaries of the German jurisdiction to give rights to people that do not reside in Germany. Let's go ahead with Article 14, talking about the right to property. Property and the right of inheritance shall be guaranteed. Property entails obligation, obligations, and expropriation shall only be permissible for the public good. Then we come to the key article as regards climate change cases, which is Article 20A, recently added to the German Constitution. Article 28 talks about the protection of natural foundations of life and animals. Accordingly, mindful also of its responsibility towards future generations, the state shall protect the natural foundations of life. Natural foundations of life. Do you see anything that resonates with human dignity belonging not only to German citizens but to humans in general? Yes, I would see that. So, in light of this constitutional background, the German case went as follows. Now things are going a bit technical, but we can overlook them just to go directly to the substance of the case. There is a piece of legislation enacted in Germany as far as 2021 called the Federal Climate Protection Act. This Federal, Federal, Federal Climate Protection Act is a piece of primary legislation enacted by the German parliament as a consequence and on the basis of international agreements took in Paris in order to protect, uh, uh, actually to prevent from climate change indesirable effects, so to protect the weather. There are a few provisions in that piece of, legis in that piece of legislation that make us understand that Germany has self-imposed commitments to pursue long-term goals of green ga greenhouse gas neutrality by 2050. Accordingly, they said, in paragraph 3 of that legislation, Article 1, that greenhouse gas emissions must be gradually reduced by the target year 2030 by at least 55%, uh, taking as comparison the 1990 level. Paragraph 4, third sentence, sets out the annual allowable emissions amounts for various sectors in line with the reduction quota for the target year 2020. So they say how much quota, how, how big is the quota of CO2 greenhouse gas in general must, can, that can be emitted by everything that is in Germany, that is subjected to German legislation, by 2030. Paragraph 4 says that in 2025, so in four years, actually in five years, because it's end 2020, let's say in four or five years approximately, the federal government, German federal government, must set an annually decreasing emission amounts for further period from 2030 to 2050. So they have decided how much quotas can be allocated in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions before 2030. Then they have been quite vague in fixing this, these quotas. They have just indicated that. Then they have said from 2025 to 2030, we have to be more specific in saying exactly what we can reduce in those five years that, are, uh, that, that will be left before the, 2000, the 2030 target year. Then, after 2030, we don't know. No provisions are included in the act. This, is the state, this, was, this was the state of federal legislation in Germany 
after the Paris Agreement in 2009. Okay, so what happens here? Basically, the constitutional complaints were about the idea that the Germany, while enacting that piece of legislation, had failed to introduce a legal framework which was sufficient for swiftly reducing the greenhouse gases, especially CO2. They say that that legislation was not sufficient in order to force German private, uh, private individuals or groups or even the German state to reduce e effectively those gas. So to undertake those obligations that Germany had assumed while in 2016 signing the Paris Agreement. The complaints deemed this to be necessary, so a more detailed regulation deemed to be necessary, because a temperature, a temperature increase of more than 1.5 Celsius degrees would place millions of lives in danger and would risk the crossing of tipping points with unforeseeable consequences for the climate system. They claim that the reduction of CO2 emissions as laid down in the Federal Climate Change Act is not sufficient to stay within the remaining CO2 budget that will correspond to a temperature increase of 1.5 Celsius. So they take some data, analytical data, which are the data to which we need to, to, be, to confront with, because they are the data that are at the substance, at the, they lie at the roots of the, client, of the claim raised by the claimants, the complainants, and by referring to those data, they argue that the way Germany has acted, the way the German parliament has acted while passing that legislation is inconsistent with the objectives set out in the Paris Agreement and undertook, undertaken by German itself. Okay, interestingly enough, we notice that two, these two things as regards the complainants themselves, so the actors who brought the claim before the court. Some of them do not live in Germany and have no relationship whatsoever with Germany as a country. They do live in Bangladesh and in Nepal. But nevertheless, they take articles of the German constitution in order to derive a right to be executed vis-a-vis -vis the German government because Germany, Germany did not act sufficiently to prevent climate change and climate change affects them that live outside Germany, who live outside Germany as well. And the article they take as a fun, as a substance, like as a as a platform, so to say, as a legal basis for their claim, are primarily Article 20A, right to protect the foundations of life, in conjunction with Article 2 and Article 14, inviolability of rights and the right to property and the fundamental right to an ecological minimum standard of living that is derived from Article 2 in conjunction with Article 20 and with Article 1. To, to, to be more uh, like concrete, they, what, just they said, what they just said is that there's a duty which binds German authorities to protect their fundamental rights even if they, are, they live outside Germany because they have they are part of the obligation of protecting the fundamentals of life, being human beings. So part of the life of the nature of, of which Germany has undertaken the obligation to protect, which Germany has undertaken the obligation to protect, and plus they derive from the conjunction between Article 20, Foundations of Life, and Article 1, Protection of Human Dignity, a fundamental right to an ecological minimum standard of living, so they say, since Germany recognizes human dignity as the center of their constitution, as the key concept of, their, of its constitution, we as human beings, although we live outside Germany, are entitled to a minimum standard of ecological uh, living. Uh, that's why we can ask the German constitutional court to compel the German government to act more efficiently in protecting climate change. And if the, 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 the legal provision enacted by the German parliament in protection of the climate change is not sufficient to reach the objectives that would safeguard our right to minimum ecological standard of living, then that provision is non-constitutional. This is what they try to argue. What, is, what are the findings of the court? First of all, the court acknowledges that uh, the Climate Change Protection Act places the, st the state under an obligation to take climate action because it's aimed at achieving climate neutrality. 
this plan of neutrality entails a balancing, yes, be between the protection of the planet and other rights of interest, yes, the obligation to take planned action is accorded increasing weight as climate change intensifies. First concept, climate change is intensifying. This is a finding that comes from analysis of data. So the court must rely on data in order to say that climate change is intensifying. The extent on which it is intensifying, the nature of the change of the climate, these are all empirical evidence that are turned into law in that reasoning, although we cannot quantify them concretely. Again, ahead. Under Arvind, the current extreme urgency, current extreme urgency likewise follow the same ratio as before, and the behavior that leads to an exceeding of the critical temperature threshold for achieving the constitution of climate goals would only be justified under strict conditions. So they put forward what is called a strict scrutiny, a constitutional strict scrutiny for every measure which entails climate change bad effects. And they do so because they assume that climate change is currently under an extreme urgency. And they assume it on the basis of data. More, they say that the scope of the regulation, the Federal Act protecting climate change, is not only national, but also international, due to the expansion, expansive force of Article 28, which refer to nature and is tied, intertwined with human dignity. So the scope of the action that German government has entailed the obligation to take is not only national, but also international. That's why Nepal and Bangladesh claimants are entitled to sit before the court. Oh, now, in the first place, the legislated implementation of constitutional mandates as integrated by the international agreements undertaken by Germany, of course, entails a leeway of discretion. There's a margin of appreciation for the German parliament and government in doing, in performing, in implementing the regulations of state. Yet, a special duty of care is imposed by Article 20, 28, on the legislation. So the legislator is not entirely free when it comes to using these leeways. If there is scientific uncertainty regarding causal relationships of environmental relevance, Article 20A imposes this special duty of care, which entails an obligation to even take account of mere indications pointing to the possibility of serious or irreversible impairments as long as these indications are sufficiently reliable. Here, the German Constitutional Court overtly opens to knowledge which comes from analytic observation and storage of data as regards those observations, as a consequence of such an observation. What happens now? Anyway, you can read this slide that I don't think is very well. Anyway, it was written that the con the, they acknowledge that the constitutionally relevant temperature threshold of well below two degrees can in principle be converted into a remaining global CO2 budget, which can then be allocated to states. So they uh, revise what the Paris agreements have put into force, the mechanism behind the allocation of quota to different states, and then the allocation of those quotas to different activities, which is part of the leeway of discretion left to states. The Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change has to find specific remaining global CO2 budgets for various temperature thresholds and different probabilities of occurrence using a quality assurance process in which the degree of residual uncertainty is openly stated. So they are trying to explain to us which was the empirical proce the procedure which brought to the assumption of data as relevant for legislation. It is true that because of this duty, estimates on the size of the remaining global CO2 budget must, take, must be taken into account even though they involve uncertainties. Using the emission amount stipulated in, in the legislation analyzed, the remaining budget calculated by the German Advisory Council on the Environment on the basis of the estimates before mentioned will be largely used by us by the year 2030. So they say, as much as the German governmental offices have taken into account the data and have interiorized the mechanism and are highlighted by the international agreements in Paris, 
the quote, there is a strong hint that the quota left Germany will be already consumed before 2030. So we will leave these five years without protection. However, the, the Constitutional Court continues, given the uncertainties presently involved in the calculations of the remaining budget, such a compliance, Germany's compliance with the obligations stemming from the international level, is not sufficiently extensive to be considered objectionable under constitutional law by the Federal Constitutional Court. So as far as the, measure, the measurability of the indicators, German Constitutional Court spe specifically says that data are not sufficiently reliable in order to straightforwardly state, declare a law, uh, a law unconstitutional because of the not compliance with those data. Although the mechanism by which that data has been obtained and elaborated has been highlighted by the court and has been considered reasonable by the court. Nevertheless, paragraph 3.1 and paragraph 4.1 of that, uh, of the, of that uh, piece of legislation do not satisfy the requirement arising from the principle of proportionality that the reduction of CO2 emissions to the point of climate neutrality respect, uh, uh, point of climate neutrality respect systematically and consequently be distributed over time in a forward-looking manner that respects fundamental rights. So what the German Constitutional Court is trying to say here is that what we can infer is that the, the remaining quotas of our budget, the budget that the, the, the international agreement has left to Germany, must be rationally distributed in a forward-looking manner so that the current provision on allowable emissions, emission amounts, has now established a path for to future burdens and freedom. The impacts of future freedoms are disproportionate from today's perspective. So today we have to look at what happens in the future and we have to make those new implement, not the, the legislation we make today consistent with the idea that we have to be left a sufficient amount of quota for the future. Why? For the principle of fair distribution of the reduction burden over time. One generation, the Constitutional Court of, of Germany says, must not be allowed to consume large portions of the CO2 budget while bearing a relatively minor share of the reduction effort, if this would involve leaving subsequent generations with a drastic reduction burden and expose their lives to comprehensive losses of freedom. In fact, at some point in the future, even serious losses of freedom may be deemed proportionate and justified under constitutional law in order to prevent climate change. This is the rationale deployed by the Constitutional Court. They said we cannot prevent future generation from using at least a sufficient quota of gas emissions because what we consider now proportionate before the loss of quota of gas emissions, let's say almost everything because we don't see directly, we are not directly affected, in general, generally speaking, we are not directly affected by climate change, may not be considered proportionate in the future and in the future we would consider proportionate much more stringent limitations to our freedom because climate change effects could have become much more compelling. This is the rationale put forward by the court. So the efforts required of constitutional law to reduce greenhouse gas emissions will, have, will be considerable if after 2030 we already know no legislative provision is, is set for by act and we already know that all the quotas allocated to Germany will be exhausted. Whether this exhaustion of quota allocated to Germany will be so drastic as to entail unacceptable impairments of fundamental rights, from today's perspective, is impossible to determine. But it is not reasonable to run the risk. It is not reasonable from today's perspective to run the risk of having very small quotas of CO2 budget still available so that we have to suffer a very considerable reduction of our freedoms and our rights before the obligation, which will be much more stringent in the future, to reduce our climate relevant activities. This is the prognostic proportionality, assess uh, prognostic proportionality assessment. German Constitutional Court is trying to make proportionality work, not only for the from the perspective of today's rights for today's people, but also looking forward and looking at what will be the balancing for future generations to come 
vis-à-vis the obligation of respecting climate, vis-à-vis the obligation to implement activities which are climate change friendly. This is a novelty in constitutional law. It's a very sensible novelty for constitutional laws because it not only it increases quite remarkably the powers of a court, whose syndicate, whose scrutiny on legislative activity becomes quite more robust, as everybody may understand, but also because it changes the structure of rights, of constitutional rights, especially of the rights to life and property, which have always been considered negative rights, only negative, not entailing positive actions by governments. Only negative, all the state must only respect somebody else's life and somebody else's property. Historically, especially in Germany, those two rights have only been given a negative meaning, which is not the case now, because from those negative rights, positive action is derived for the government to implement. And it is, implement, it is derived not only for the, the citizens of Germany, but also from, for citizens of Nepal, Bangladesh, and anywhere else in the world. Uh, sorry, so, sorry, Giuliano. We're I'm over. Okay. This is the conclusion. <laughs> which is the role for data science in light of this kind of scrutiny? Which data to use? Germany has relied, Germany's constitutional court has relied on some data. Yet, the, the choice of those data, they choose, they choose exactly to, to, to follow the steps of the German advisory board, which is accountable to the German government only, so it's only on the uh, in second hand accountable to parliament and it's not really, really, really scrutinizable by anybody else because it's a technical body. Would the choice of data modify the objectives of the legislator? Of course, as it's quite evident. And how would it be possible to control the data maker and the data analyst from which the knowledge considered as law by the German Constitutional Court derives? The technique monopolists, of course, have an enormous lawmaking power, come to have an enormous lawmaking power in this case. So eventually, there will be a very much of an extension in scope of constitutional law judgment based on proportionality, but the nice thing is that legislators will be urged to undertake reasonable solutions when reasonable is calculated on an earth-wide base. And this is quite a, a little bit of a revolution. Of course, it's a revolution which that must happen, that has not happened yet because the consequences of the judgments were very minor, the practical consequence. But still, at least the principle has be, have been set. So at least the ideas are airing, are circulating, and this is not an obvious thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Giuliano. So another very different uh, uh, speak in the end. Um, so one thing that I want, I, I would like to, to, to highlight here is that we have, we've seen here four different talks and with very, I mean, data was central in all of them, but people were using data in a very different way I mean, in, in the end. And uh, one thing that I'm always curious about, I mean, I, I work with applied data science, so I'm always curious about that, how people handle that. And in, in the last years, um, what I saw is, is really a struggle that people try to do that uh, through collaborations. So we have someone from data science or someone from math or whatever. And then you have someone from applied, applied uh, science that could be any, any like social sciences, could be uh, environment or whatever. And then usually in, in this, when we have this, this, this uh, schema, we usually the data scientist or the mathematician or whatever, is like the numbers provider and the person from, from the application or social science or whatever, is like, it's either bringing the problem, when this is the case, this is a good, a good scenario, or is it, it's bringing data. <coughs> and then this is usually very, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not very, uh, a, very pop a very powerful way of handling stuff. <coughs> and, uh, but today here, I, I saw some, some, some cases where we have, we begin to have something like social data scientists or, or or something like that, that people that can really go deep in, in both data science and the applied science. And, and I think this is uh, probably the, the, the future of, of how we're going to integrate, may maybe creating integrated courses where we have uh, either uh, in both uh, data science skills and, and, other, and other applied science skills too. So 
but um, it was very interesting for me at least, and, and I think also for for the audience. I don't know if uh, we have time for for, for questions. Do you have? Uh, Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know anyone. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So I, I have many questions, but I can I can I just yep. Let me, I just got some some quick notes here. So about Janice, I was wondering what what were the challenges you faced with data imbalance uh, when you're, especially when you're doing the, the inference, uh, because suddenly, I mean, it must be much less frequent than, frequent than, than CES or whatever, other class. Uh, yeah, the data, data imbalance that, that uh, and also the the annotation and, and and how do we evaluate the generalization of the model? Uh, so I don't know if uh, would she answer now or would keep for for later. This is really open for question, but we are really late on time, okay. unfortunately. Okay. So I think it would be better to make proposal questions and then we can finish uh, okay. talking okay. after the session. Okay. But okay. I'm that's sorry. That's <laughs> you no, no. Yeah, that, that's no problem. So I, I, I so I'm, I'm just going to thank you, the the audience and all the speakers. I mean, to me it was very interesting, and so thank you, thank you all for for the presence. Yeah. I'll sorry, I'll then make the last comment or question, just to wrap up. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting that was in maybe all presentations, maybe not much in 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 Butler's presentation, but in the other three, is. Um, the difficulty in acquiring data and processing that data, either for um, legal regulation or for how do we uh, do research on music and music consumption throughout regions and different groups. So this is a challenge that seems to be shared by all presentations. And maybe in your case, too, Janice, you said, look, look we have the text, but fine-tuning the model so we can understand uh, this very humane things as irony, sarcasm, it's very challenging, so I think that although we had very different papers, topics, and backgrounds here, I think that what we could highlight here is that uh, it's not easy working with data, and as you said, that you um, working together and have places like this where we can, even coming from very different backgrounds, see what the other one is doing is good, because we can also think of courses and training, and tomorrow we have a, a, a Table to around uh, about critical pedagogies and digital pedagogies. That's very interesting because we have to work together more and more to tackle these challenges, as you said. Mm, just yeah, repeating. Yeah. And in the end, I think it's not only. I mean, uh, getting the data is, is is also part of the problem, right? Because sometimes you, you you have a problem, you want to answer something, but then you need to identify not only the models that can help you to do that, but also what data sources can be used to that, and could be effective actually to to help you in, in the end. So it's many times you have a problem and you don't have a good data source and, and in the end the project is dead just because you don't have a, a data source to answer that. So it's it's also critical for, for, for that. Yeah. So we think there's data everywhere, but that's not true. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Not, yeah at so at thank least. you. Yeah, thank you very much. We'll head for a quick lunch um, and be back 2.20, so we're 20 minutes late. Please, <laughs> thank you.